backup video. Yeah. I will, once we get this, where are we? Lives, that should be in here. Why is that not on there? Go back. Let's try that again. Where did... Let's close my video. Right, can I edit the settings from here? I'm pretty sure I can. Don't need to hear that. Still laughing at the door 14 boys getting they managed to get Katie Marsden for an interview, and there's at least four or five elite league teams who will not talk to them. Utterly, I don't even, I don't even know um, who it is. If I'm being honest, I'm not being a dick. Uh, I've seen them no. taggers in a few things, but I'm not entirely familiar with them. Ah, uh, they're, they're, they're sound lads. It's just they, they wanted a, they wanted a, an independent Belfast voice because. The view from the bridge is technically club media now, so they just did their own thing. It very much bad. feels, very much feels like that, doesn't it? Well, right. they are. Where the view from the bridge is official club media now. Oh, are they like they're fully legit? They have been for the last couple of years, yeah. That's yeah, why they get. Bridge. That's why they get the team on so often because the team get told they have to do it. <laughs> I mean, but I mean that makes getting interviews a lot fucking easier, doesn't it? Just a smidgen. <laughs> like, uh, boys, you have to be on there. Okay, well, great. They're the worst interviews, though, because when you get told you have to do an interview... I think the, there's, they've retained an element of editorial control. So they will be told... So they will generally be told you can't broach X subject, but they do not... But what they don't, what the club don't do is the club get no editing ability on the, on the podcast. That's so... Fair. They'll say, don't touch this subject if you'd be so kind. You know, like if someone's mum and dad have just had a massive spat on, you know, fought and they've just got divorced, like don't don't talk about the family. Well, fine, but the club don't get the club don't get don't get any editorial control over the podcast. I think Paddy and Davey retain all of that. That's but, good. It's, but it's I mean my criticism to them is that sometimes they've been a little bit too forgiving. What um, of the two? Yeah. And help help me out here, mate. Why I'm trying to find a how to fucking switch this onto uh, from listed to un from unlisted to like live because normally it pop up in the dashboard, but it's not because obviously it's not live yet. Mm. It's not it's not sitting in the live um live stream either. It's not, it's not sitting in it's not sitting in the live is are you in Creator Studio? Yeah. No, give me one second. Let me, let me. I was in the studio one sec. Yeah, I was in like, like on the page. Hmm. Let me try that. Let me try reopening this. Um, because I thought you'd be able to do it from Creative Studio, but I generally don't mate, do my streams unlisted, do I? I just I point yeah. and fire and run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Uh, yeah, so I was in, I was in there, and it's just not sitting anywhere. And if I mean, worst case is it just go again and just go live straight off the top, but yeah. Um. Yeah, it's not that fun. potentially, but yeah. Oh not, no, here we go. I, I, I've I've refreshed it now and went on to something different, and it is it is now popping up. Yeah. So technically, public publish, we should now be live. If when you boys want to check that on YouTube, yeah, I'm just on, checking it on your on your phone. Yeah. yeah. That button there. It may not. It may take a minute to show up. Yeah, no, there fine. we are. There we all are. Yeah, we're live. We mate. are there, there folks. Are. Happy days. Yeah. Well, let me just finish this really quickly, and we will get started. As Ant would say, a bit of housekeeping off the top. Um. Right, we have a title. We are live on 4,000 and Counting Facebook, ladies and gentlemen. So, hello and welcome to 4,000 and Counting. I'm Wattie, and today I am lucky enough to be joined by a couple of fellow UK hockey podcasters. My boy, Mr. Anthony Russell from Banners on the Wall, and my other Mr. Legend himself, Mr. Ben Hyde from Zero Pucks Given. Ladies and gents, we have a live show for you, so... Welcome to 4,000 again, boys. We've done this a few times. No worries, buddy. No yeah, worries. Good evening, mate. We, of course, off the top need to say congratulations to Ben, of course, announced today as one of the commentary team for the Southern Playoff Weekend alongside the uh, alongside the fantastic 
uh, Chris Beal, a man with a fantastic amount of experience. This is a man for uh, Chris is a man who works for he works for F1, doing media bits and pieces. He's commentated oh, nice. on hockey way back to the old commentary and NHL plays before they stopped playing and then came back. So Ben is you're in very very good hands with Chris Ben. So uh, just you know, remember, you, remember you are live on Channel Four. Do not swear. Yeah. Uh, what? Here you can do whatever the hell you like. Yeah, this okay, really shouldn't uh, be an issue. I think we've 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 not decided who's going to call play by play, who's going to do analysis. We'll uh, we've we've got six games to figure out who's better at doing which. So <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure he will call Streatham and I will call Chelmsford at the very least. Um, sorry, lads. I'm just responding. People asking on Facebook if if this is still on. Yes, we are on. So please do share, tag people. I imagine. That you'll be able to access the chat as well if you want to get involved in that. But we are here to talk about the 23-24 oh, yeah. season. We're also here to talk about what is to come in the next three weekends of ice hockey. Boys, both both of you cover majority different leagues, but obviously touch on both leagues. So we'll, we'll start top of the chain. And we are heading in to the playoffs. And this is exciting times. I much prefer the group stage versus the quarterfinals. It means we get more hockey. It means the boys get more wages. Um, so <laughs> there's a, there's a player in me there. You mean you get you, you get an extra couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks holiday money. But the groups are set. What what do you make of the groups? And obviously you got two strong teams at the top of each group who you would expect probably to go through from what you were saying on your stream last night. Where, where do you, where do you see the rest of it kind of going? Oh, it's a tough, it's a tough one. This one. I was, I was, I was muddling around with this because I've, um, for folk, for folk who aren't aware, I do a, um, I do a program series. that I was just that sort of, I can send out the clubs, but one of the clubs that I've done a lot of, writing for this year is um is the Raiders. Um they've had the they've had the the article in the program every week. And the one thing I did wonder was actually whether this group stage we've had we've had Romford who've had this massive upswing in form over the last couple of weeks where it's been such a weird year. And you think about how Romford hadn't really pressed on post getting to the playoff final last year, running leads right down to the wire and just just missing out on winning winning the playoffs. And then they've had a year where they just kind of fluctuated wildly. And then I wondered whether the, whether the the six game round robin format actually benefited them at all because they're doing really really well, but it almost means that their chances of making Coventry are massively diminished as, a, as opposed to having to take on a Peterborough side like they did last year. It was basically half the team half the team were some injured, most of the team were pretty injured, and it was you know like scarecrows and you know close horses and whoever you could stick a pair of skates on the throw out there so i get why people do i think having the six game round robin is the closest thing we're going to get in british hockey to kind of having series right because effectively instead of having one series of seven games against one team you get a chess match against everybody else all at once and i think there's a, there's a level of excitement that we that's the best we can kind of generate in british hockey to kind of get to that point two game series are fine they work, obviously, and it's a very British thing, of course. You know, two two legs aggregate. It's ingrained from football in it. But um, I think for me at the moment, my big my biggest thing is that I'm struggling to see past the top four not making Coventry, and I realise the top four have made the playoffs in every other league bar one, um, which is North One, um, and North One have one, two, three, and five. Um, so yeah, um, so that's what you get. But yeah, in um, in all, in the, in terms of, in terms of the national, for me, I I have a lot of time for the I have a lot of time for the Raiders as an organisation. But in terms of Group B, it's really hard to see past Milton Keynes and Swindon. If I'm 100 percent honest, people are sleeping a bit on Swindon, yeah. and, uh, and, and that feels a bit of it feels a bit of a weird thing to say at the side that finished third. And Swindon, of course, haven't made commentary since 2014. Um, I was still fucking playing that season. That is madness. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the like, how is yeah. that even? I I saw someone commented on your Twitter today, mm. or yesterday, or whatever. I saw the comment come up, and I was like, that can't be right. No, but I remember really when happened. they did made it, they had all the fucking tracksuits in it, didn't they? Like, like they did. Like they, had, yep. like they were on the FA Cup Jolly Boys like day out. It was one of my. Um, it's one of the one of the conversations that Dave Cloutman. Uh, and I have had many, many times over the years because for people unfamiliar, so that Swindon's last appearance in Coventry, they lost in the semi-final to the Manchester uh, to the Manchester Phoenix. Aku Pekarainen, Finnish import defenseman, called for uh, called for hooking 
in overtime. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, it was a hook. It would have been a hook in minute one. And it was a hook in minute whatever it was, 62-63. And Phoenix scored on the power play in overtime. And Swindon have not been back to Coventry since. Um I think Ladies and gents, I believe that story is actually, if you go to look through the YouTube archive, I believe that that. Dave tells that story on our podcast at some point. Look for a picture of a zebra. I've got a very funny feeling there's a fucking zebra in the YouTube thumbnail. But (laughs) yeah, he he does tell that story. For those that just quick rundown, for those that aren't familiar with the groups, it is the the Bees, the Seahawks, the Knights, the Phantoms, and then the Lightning, the Raiders, the Wildcats, and the Tigers. Ben, how much of the the national have you been paying attention to this year? Um, not not really watching it as such, but keeping up to date with what's going on. I mean, I know the Raiders just they just tend to sneak in there, regardless of how their season is going. They always seem to qualify for the playoffs. Um, in fact, their second team kind of does the same thing down, down in one. Unfortunately, this year they were just short. But uh, yeah, I, I I think I can see the Raiders getting out of that group. Swindon have massively improved since they've gone home. That, I mean, it does it does help having your rink back, and yeah. especially especially Swindon because from a player's perspective, right, it's, it's fairly piece of piss to get to even for the lads that travel. You get there, parking's never an issue. You go in, you've got the gym upstairs. You can go ride the bike. You can go and do whatever. The locker room's really nice. You have a bit out the back of the locker room. You can go and hang your coat. Sounds like really princessy, but it's not. It's like. When you're coming to the rink, all these things taken care of. You go out in the back room, there's two physio beds set up. You want any physio treatment, you're there. Just all these little like, home comforts that you have from being in your in your own barn is is massive. And it's the thing with Swindon as well. Swindon is a, Swindon is an organisation. I was saying this to um, I was saying this to Tom uh, to Tom Graham, who's done a few you've done a few bits and pieces and commentated on a few bits and pieces this year. And I was joking about it, but I was like, you know, reliable old Swindon. Inter- but actually, one of the big things with Swindon is that stability factor. And actually, this year for Swindon has been the ultimate curveball of literally getting to opening night and they can't use the rink for two and a half months. How would the organisation kind of survive? And actually, one of the things about the fact they have been so stable for so long was the fact that actually sponsors were giving them office space to use so you know people were able to kind of step up and kind of move things and people were prepared to do things for the cats because you know they'll come good for it later on down the line and it will actually for me it's one of those and for me being me you know i got i like looking in depth into bits and pieces of this the massive asterisks especially consider on this season considering as well how swindon have performed how would swindon have done if they'd had the entire year at home and hadn't had to play home games in Cardiff or Milton Keynes. And oh, I was at that Cardiff that game they, they lost against Solway, mate. Yeah. And it's, it, and that's, that for me is like, like I say, I mean, it's an asterisk to a point because I think we can all, we can all pretty much agree people who've watched the national with any frequency this year, leads are a wagon and they deserve to be champions. And it's not like there's no, there's no controversy about that, but it is the great what if scenario for me this season of, what would have happened in terms of that top three being closer to Swindon potentially, you know, get closer to the title had they had the opportunity to to do that. But Swindon as an organisation take care of people. And I think that's the... Every I time I was there, mate, uh, I was there several yeah. different occasions, never fault them for yeah. not taking care of the players. But I'm calling this now, like I said, I don't I don't make predict whenever people ask me at the beginning of the year, I don't make predictions of who will finish first, who will finish second. Like my preview at the beginning of this year was here is the ceiling for everybody, here is the floor for everybody. And I was pretty much right about a couple of teams. I was right about the Bs. I said that best they were going to finish in the mid table. The playoffs are pretty much I reckon they'll do playoffs and they got there. Um and and I was really wrong about Bristol because I thought Bristol would be higher than they were. Um, but I will, the fire. I will, but I will, I will call this now. I think Swindon make Coventry. I don't necessarily know whether they finish first or second because I do seriously like as much as I think you can't count out any team that had, that Tom Watkins coaches and you can't count out the Raiders on the upswing they're on. I think having watched, having watched enough of the national this year. For every criticism I have of MK, 
they're too good. And I think irrespective of the fact that whether Aaron Nell plays or not, because he has been injured the last couple of weeks and has obviously been rested because why wouldn't you? Why would but you I think, it, yeah. Yeah, but I think Swin I think Swindon I think Swindon and MK out of group B. Group A the, the group A for me is a lot more open because I think that the toss you've got the B's playing with house money. You know, the bees are essentially, essentially like yeah. it's essentially like clerks. We weren't even supposed to be here today because nobody believes they'd make it. Um Peterborough are Peterborough and they are the most annoying team on God's green earth and will and always do the thing you don't want them to do. Bring in Schuster's back, man. Like mm. whether it's for some part, whether it's for all part, we got to see him down in four thousand counting charity game this year. Mm. And Obviously, he was on my team for it, so I I got to have a little bit of a fucking knock around out there with him. Mm. Boy can play, man! Like he can really yeah. fucking play. Like yeah. he when I was playing with him in that charity game, I was like, would have loved him as a line mate when we were, I was playing. Like he would have been the perfect line mate for me. He he grit. He's gritty. He's big. He's strong. He's got good hands. Like he supports the puck well. I, I really like him, and his points speak for himself. I think he's averaging two points a game over the twenty games he played earlier in the year. Yeah, but yeah, Group A for me is the one that's much more open because I think that, and I think people know that I have a, I love Hull and I love Matty Davis, but I think the issue that we've seen from Hull is that they've started to tire a little bit as towards the end of the year, and the quest the door opens there for Peterborough. I think I'm not convinced the bees are going to mount the biggest of playoff challenges because Marcel Balac can only score so many points by himself. Yes. Um but. You know, it could you know Leeds could Leeds could drop an egg, and you know we could we could be looking at Peter and Peter and bees up in uh up in Coventry. I I I'm pretty certain Leeds will make I'll it. I eat my fucking hat, second, mate. Yeah, I'm, I think the, <laughs> no, I think, I'll but straight Slav's, up eat my hat on the next nah, episode for real. I know, I know, but but Slav, Slava Kulikov hockey at the death, and you know as well, Slava had that interview about a couple of months ago where they said they weren't focusing on the league. So what has Slava been cooking up in that, in that you know that evil mastermind brain of his to take out to take out Hull? I think becomes the the big question there. So when you say uh, you're not focusing on the league though, and you still got to be focused on winning fucking hockey games, and that's something they didn't do enough of this year. I think, Don't get me wrong; they won 28 yeah. games. They won 28 yeah, yeah. games. Their, ar- still, their as... argument will be the in- their argument from their side will be injuries, which uh, to which I suppose my, my response and everybody's response, yeah, would be. Uh, unfortunately that is the nature of a very very intense physical combat you know uh, combative sport that people do get hurt um you know even i've hit, even i've been hitting the chest with puck sitting in the blooming stand so you know it's, it's it's dangerous no matter what what element of it you get but the the national playoffs i think are there's a few more questions about it and i think you know for for ben someone who focuses on south one i think we've kind of seen apart from maybe invicta versus solon last weekend we've known the top three were going to make Ali Pali because the top three in South one are a different breed to the rest of the division this year. Whereas actually in the national, and I think probably the one thing the national maybe does not get enough credit of, especially considering this year where in the elite league, the Steelers have just been walking off into the distance for <laughs> for the better part of half, yeah. of half of it. The national is super competitive as a division. Like, Irrespective of the fact that Leeds have won the title quite comfortably, Hull took them apart in the cup, mm. and yep. like there's a, and there's that there's well, it know, almost solely... happened last year as well, mate. Where the Phantoms put a fucking dick in on them, didn't they? Yeah, and then and then they somehow you know that second they, leg that they... second leg was hilarious. What you poor what you poor Callum Hepburn having played North one all year thrown into it's net for like, one game so... and just shell for sixty minutes, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't like. I'm, I'm interested. To, like I said, Ben's obviously kept up on it. He doesn't watch it that regular, but I'm interested to hear his hear his perspective on like the competitiveness yeah. of the of the divisions we watch sort of against each other. Because I've I've watched them. I've watched some properly hilarious hockey this year, having done all the having done all the divisions. But I obviously don't watch South One as regularly as he does. So no, I, with the national, the I mean, you can see when the results come in, there's capabilities of. Anyone beating anybody. Solway have had an incredible year, pulled out some great results for their first year up in the national. Um, as you're right, Leeds are a, a steam train. They've got some lads in there that, in all honesty, probably should be getting GB lookings. At the very Ooh. least, they should be getting elite league lookings. In cool. Ben, Kim can you Brown, remind Ollie me 
to come back to that. Uh, I know we're on the national now. Remind me to come back to that topic. We'll, we'll note that one for later. Yeah, I'm going to actually write it down so I forget. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they've got they've got the best players in the league, probably Leeds have. So they, you know, quite rightly sort of run away with it. But yeah, as I said earlier, with the Raiders, like the Raiders can just go places and, and beat people. And having who's, you know, been recently named the best under 20 player in the league in TJ Anderson, a player who I'd seen quite a lot of over the last few years, um, bringing them young lads through. They've got another one waiting there as well to come up in Brindley Caps. Mm. This kid seems to be a uh, shout out to TJ first, another 4,000 charity game boy. Nice. That was a f- I'd liked him when I watched him down in Basingstoke last year, rated him very highly. Another one when I got to see him out on the ice and you're actually near him and in and amongst it. Very talented hockey player. No surprise to see him get it. Um, yeah, talk to me about this other kid though, because he's putting up fucking stupid points, isn't he? And he's only a baby. Oh, I mean, ridiculous. 41 goals in 28 league games <laughs> in South One at 16 years old. I think he's six, he's, six foot two. Yeah. he's six foot two. He's he's not built like a brick shit house, but he trains. He trains hard. He's uh, him and his sister Ellie Wakelin train with the same guy. Um, so he's getting all the best out of his physical abilities that he's got. His hands are unreal. He's got this. He's got this mentality that is so much older than his years actually suggest. When when Darren Elliott was on with me. Darren said he was chirping him in the face off. He was saying to him, do you want me to go left-handed? Should I go a little bit easier? Oh, you're time? fucking ancient, LZ, mate. <laughs> You've retired like 47 times. Let the kid chirp you. Shut up, old man. Yeah, I, yeah. I love it. I love LZ. He's, he's honestly, something. he's a privilege to watch. Absolute he, privilege to watch Brindley Caps. And, he's, mate, and he's, he's doing good things. Me. He's a good lad as well. Oh, I love that. Love when the young lads jump on. I was lucky enough to have um, Alex Graham on before he went off to the OHL. And like that that was awesome. And then we've had some of the other like younger lads on. Um, Gary Kelly uh, spoke to Kyle Carruth and that. Kyle Carruth, try, try to get some words out of that boy was difficult, but he has no problem scoring three Michigans in a season, though. So, you know, <laughs> do, do what you do best and you don't have to do interviews but it's, it's nice to hear from the young guys well these guys should have voices and they should be characters because as much as obviously the national league that the games are being being streamed via the um by the clubs they're, they're putting on their own live streams that they're charging for the elite league is available to watch online i'd like to see a bit more of it happening in the south one and north one but these lads are there's stuff like 4,000 counting, Banners on the Wall, Zero Pucks, Door 14, Pucking Mad, Macca's Talk. This stuff is out there now. These guys can get that exposure. They can get all of their sort of stuff out there from their clubs. And I think I think they really enjoy it. And it's great that these young guys can have a voice. I think it's a strange one in some ways as well, isn't it? Because you the a lot of them just don't know. And this is one of the things I've I've had this year with uh, with with my bits and pieces I've done with the with the Solon Devils this year because the conversation I had with, with Alex Murray at the beginning of the year was actually like the Devils don't get their due as a club like they they put on they put on something in a rink that let's face it is you now um, in the that sport. was very and play think, and shit's the word you're looking for I think that here's and the then thing, right? Stoke, though so I'll shut up. <laughs> the walls aren't green at the moment. Yeah, but the thing, the thing with the de- the thing with the Devils is that the Devils are the, the the thing I said to Alex Murray was the Devils as a club are a bit introverted and actually doing some of these things, letting some not just like people outside of Salem, but some of their own fans didn't seem to quite get who some of the guys were. You know, get, getting to speak to people like Harry Clapman. Harry Clapman's the youngest head coach in He's the NHL, and he is Love just he is uh, he like I say getting getting into talk was was you know was a bit difficult, and some of them just don't know. Some don't know how to do it. Alex Cole, it'll be easier. Um, did you say, did you say getting Harry Cloutman was uh, it was difficult to get him to talk? It, what was interesting was when when the camera turned on, he was a little bit he was a little bit apprehensive, and I think a chunk of it. And I don't know whether Ben's had this issue, um, but and, and I, I don't know whether you've had it as well, Nikki. But the thing that these boys are, are generally worried about in this circumstance, they don't want to accidentally throw their throw their mates under the bus. By no. saying something. By, the, by the way, I think I speak on behalf of all three of us. We'll fucking edit it out if you do that, lads. Don't worry. We, we ain't here to. I won't. <laughs> and, and might not. I 
I'm definitely on the players podcast side. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. if you do that on my show, and we have yeah. had a couple over the years, no names mentioned, where yeah. they've gone. There's a few stories where you have to just like uh, yeah, roll it back. But they, they... But I think Sorry, that's the problem. Of it. I think that's the problem of you uh, uh, that that people have as well is that you know I've been I've been knocking around for 13 years doing these bits and pieces, and there's still that bit of apprehension of, and it's British hockey's biggest issue is control. And it's ceding control to other uh, to other places of just like oh we don't know what this person's going to do, what's their agenda? Well, I think the I think hopefully the majority of places will know that my agenda is is that if it's bad I'll say it's bad, if it's good I'll say it's good, and ultimately I just want people to be able to tell their own story. Um, and and but uh, so a lot of these guys you have these conversations, and like you say, the young lads are growing up in the era in the era of social media where actually you'll be held accountable for what you say in a different way. Um, and some people will, with a horribly crappy pejorative thing, and say, everybody's gone woke. No, people are more aware that their, their words and their actions have consequence now. And actually, these young lads are having to navigate this because there's some people will get it right. And some people will say monumentally stupid stuff and either think it's fine or aren't prepared to be held accountable for having an opinion that makes them an asshole. Where do we um, where do we draw the line on the on ice stuff then, boys? Because there was literally not a single fucking thing you could say to me on this planet. I it might make me mad while I'm playing, and we might have to go. But I'm guessing that's why you called me in the first place. So congratulations, it obviously worked. Um, but there's nothing that I'm gonna <laughs> then go off the ice and be like, right, I need to go report this to the fucking safety officer or the DOPS. At what point do we cut the line and we go, I think racism, homophobic, everything else is on the fucking table. Like, yeah, everything else. Maybe, maybe not like missuses or moms or whatever, but you know, if it's about me, you fucking come at me. You tell me whatever you think. And we're, we're battling. Like if I get the opportunity to knock you unconscious with a hit, I'm going to do it. Like, so if you call me some hurty feeling on, on my name and names that, like, that hurt my feelings, it's the least of my worries. Like, I don't know. Where do you boys sit on it? Well, from play, I mean, I've obviously ne never played the game, but from playing football for years, I, I had that for years of the, you know, just the little words in the ear and all the, I was called a Jew once when I was playing football. Why? And, uh, apparent, I have no idea why. <laughs> why? In all That's honesty, in random. All honesty, I thought my shorts were riding a bit high. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I've, I didn't know who to go. Oh, who do you complain to about that? I'm not going to complain to anyone about it. It's not, you know, I'm not Jewish. I never took offense to it, but I think, yeah, if you're, unless you're being racist, as you say, racist, homophobic, you know, possibly even, is it fascist against the religion or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, well, that works. Every, everything else is there. A little bit of name calling, winding up. Little yeah. Pinch. I mean, it's a sport. You know, a little Brad, Brad Marchand, get your face licked. You know, <laughs> like I'll probably draw the probably draw the line at getting my face licked. I think, I've, had, I think... I've had a lick in the boxing ring. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> little blow his favourite ref as well. The <laughs> <laughs> like that. That's funny. Um for, for, for me, the line the line comes at play it's the old football adage, isn't it? Play the ball, not the man, right? If it's those bits and pieces is that are fundamental or that they can't change for me they're re for me they're off the table and like you say miss you know mrs mrs and misters and kids for me would be off the table as well but if they look like voldemort then i'm yelling every harry potter insult like, Absolutely. I used to, like you know I, I played rugby to a you know i wasn't i wasn't the best rugby player in the world but i played to i played to a decent level as a kid until my neck started making horrible noises but you know county trial county trial levels but yeah, those boys said, have it as well, said, though, don't they? If if you said the, if you said the wrong thing, I, if you said the wrong thing, it went off. I've been, you know, <laughs> yeah, 14, 15 yeah. year old me on rugby tours in France. I'm, you know, it's not the not my fine not my finest hour and stuff like that. But you know, I've been in I've been in been in fist fights. I've spear tackled people back in the days when spear Love tackles that. were under 16s rugby because of something they'd said to teammates and stuff like. And you know, I'm a I'm a different man. I'm a different man now. But you know, in you know, if there is a there is a there is a culture of using using your using your words to get a mental to get a mental advantage. And actually, yeah, if you're being competitive, trash talking is a part of it. 
there's a line for me that is too far. And like, you know, if someone, if some, if you're playing against some old boy, you know, if you are sitting in a face off against Darren Elliott, and spoiler alert, spoiler alert, Darren, uh, I am yeah. every dinosaur joke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, how was it meeting Queen Victoria? Um, like, yeah, you know, you're oh, you know, what was the Garden of Eden like kind of levels worth of stuff? You probably, because there's a chunk of stuff there that, you know, that you can, you can say to needle them, but ultimately you can have a, you can, have a laugh about it because if someone said something back to you of a similar thing and some people's criticisms of my writing anthony you fence it too much well yeah because that's what analysis is like i can take that looking you, at both you don't sides have to like, yeah you don't have to like but you don't have to like what I, you don't have to like my actions that's the thing that people can kind of get on bits and pieces like it's like if i played hockey well anthony you're crap <laughs> yeah that's where you needle me that's where you needle me at because i'll skate like a giraffe with an inner ear infection and a but... fucking ankle bender <laughs> yeah the one game i have really nearly the one game I did play where I nearly where I, uh, where I got slashed and nearly broke my thumb, but the um, I mean, that was in a charity game as well. But um, the but yeah, I know a guy that slashed somebody in the charity game once. Yeah, but the <laughs> yeah, you can, he might what, now be the director of the EIHA, but who fucking knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the um, but yeah, there's that line in it. Like there is it's a line, and yeah, and sometimes you will sometimes you will get it wrong. Um, and if you do get it wrong, you've got to take it on the chin. And you should do the thing and apologize, but you can't get you can't get upset at every at every tiny thing. It's like it's like when people get upset, you know, people start chirping and somebody points up at the scoreboard. Well, if you're five one down, you need to shut your mouth, don't you? Because you win a hockey, yeah. you don't win a hockey game by doing that. You win a hockey game by putting the by putting the puck in the net. So go also do that, that, that is that, shut up for me. And call me a dinosaur, and I'm sure. I know most of the people that follow this channel never really do, but call me a dinosaur. If you point at the scoreboard because you're dicking us 7 1, I'm going to come and break your arm on the next shift. Yeah. I'm going to jump your import. You got Jonas Hoog playing on your fucking team? I'm going to go out the next shift and I'm going to jump him. Do not, <laughs> do not point at the, especially if you're doing it. Like imagine you run into someone's barn. I don't know. It happened to us when I was playing in Bracknell. You know, Slough come in, they put a fucking eight spot on us. And you've got guys pointing to the scoreboard. You better believe like somebody's gonna take offense to that more than anything you can say because it's just disrespectful. You come into our bar and you put a, you put an eight spot on us, you don't need to be pointing to the scoreboard. It's just it's like bullshit thing to to do. And for me, that was one of the ones that would boil my piss the most. Yeah, with you and if you end up having a, a fight for it, I'm sure that was expected. Yeah. Yes. And that's that's the thing that's kind of got. I mean, we, I'm sure we're going to talk about Dops, but the like that essence of the game. I when I saw that clip of the uh, New Jersey Devils <laughs> and the New York Rangers the other night, literally oh, from so the opening plays up, I was like, yes, listen to that crowd. Tell me that people don't like this anymore. Oh, let let me share with you what my client Barry sent to me. So this was last night. And this was at 104, and it was tomorrow's viewing sorted. And it's it's a it's a screenshot, and it's like all out brawl at MSG. Rangers Devil game erupts into ten player fight after two seconds. He texted me that last night when I was trying to sleep, and now I'm like, I can't fucking sleep now. I'm like, what's happened there? And I, genuinely, like probably the most excited I've been for anything hockey related in a very long time. I think my, like I say, my 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 attitude over fighting has waxed and waned over the years because when you first get into hockey, fighting is such a visceral thing that you, you even if you don't necessarily like it, your eyes are just like whoa, like they're actually doing this like inches from my face kind of thing. And then I, I, I had a period where I didn't quite understand the necessity to it, and it was actually David Longstaff who really kind of put me, who put me in my place about it when I interviewed him a long, long time ago. Uh, before he was sort of sat on top of a pile of money that his son had given him. Um, yeah, he's, he he's like, a golden golden goose to get him on here, yeah. mate. I'm, I'm trying. But the um, but the um, but the thing the thing is, is that as long as the players accept it, it's always going to exist. My issue with what happened last night at MSG was what's the rationale behind it, right? I don't. I if I if I'm a probably Jersey a 21 Devil, year old kid getting kicked out of two games for taking but, runs at their guys when he's been in the but, league for five minutes. That's probably yeah. But but why is Jimmy fighting? If you want Rem, oh yeah, I don't I, I don't Rempe. know that yeah. Like that, and that's and that's the, that's the thing I have with like Matt Rempe is, is as an entity is is going to be massive because he is 
throw because he's a throwback element to something that's gone before. And like I, I personally, people will talk, talk about Marshawn. Marshawn is not a patch for me on Tom Wilson and his ability to do that. And this and the MHL is a league is going to benefit from having somebody like Rempe who actually can play, but is also double hard. Um, and like if, if and people double develop massive. Rempe, yeah, but I, I like if you've got if someone's run the keeper and there's a and there's a line brawl, I get it, right? Don't get you know, protect the house, no one touches the goalie. Fighting off the face off for seemingly very little reason for me. You've look because look at they the, call it know, two look, hits to the head though, right? That's what if you're New Jersey, you're saying the first one he clocks him on the head, he gets kicked out of that game. Yeah. Rempy then chicken wings him in the second game. He gets yeah. tossed. He then yeah. gives it a bye bye to the bench. But for me, Which, as a player, hilarious as well. Even in respect hilarious, is, but if you're on the other side, take, you want die. to yeah. murder him. Yeah. Yeah. Like you want to kill him. Right? There's, yeah. there's everybody. Why is even Marino if, fighting? Even why if is you're John like Marino fighting yeah. someone unrelated to this. That's if you're a skill I, guy, what I love about that is, and even though one team goes on to lose the game. The next two, three, four weeks at practice after your boys do that are the most fucking tight that your boys are ever, ever going to be, that you'll ever experience because everybody went to bat. Nobody backed down. You have guys that, like you say, why is he fighting? Well, everybody is going in that room or you're looking along the bench going, fuck, he's just... He's dropped his gloves for us, boys. That was huge. Like when Michael Pink fought Jesse Hamill, I'm like, this is a really bad idea. I'm on the ice. I'm on the face off. I will take this one. He goes, what? You fuck you. He comes back to the bench though. I mean, he got speed back a little bit. He did okay. But you, you fight the hammer. I'm like, dude, you have one career fight. This guy has 400 fights before he even left Canada. Like, But he did it. And when he comes back to the bench, that gets you so fired up. I, I'd forgotten. I had forgotten that Michael Pinch had fought Jesse Hamill. Talk about one of your all-time <laughs> bad ideas. Oh, oh dear! But that even at the you know the level that I watch more frequently, that's that for me is what it's used for. If you're not playing well, if the if the barn is quiet, do that. Get the guys up. Get the crowd up. And it, and I've seen it work. It still works. Yeah, hmm. mate. I I mean I played that role, so I know the intricate details yeah. of and I, of and either I side of it. And I can't disagree with that. Like I say, my, my thing of having, like I say, the thing for me is just having a line brawl for the sake of having a line brawl is the bit that I don't get. If you're 3-0 down at home and you need and you need a spark, you know, uh, we'll use them as an example. Oxford, right? Oxford have had a donkey of a year on the, a donkey of a year on the ice. And if and you know, Marcus Mitchell's had a couple of scraps this year. Precisely what call, a guy if, like if you can call him that. That last one was bad, Mitch. Was I love bad. you. But the but the point bad. but the point is there, right? That's what I expect out of a big hulking defenseman and our alternate captain, right? I'm not expecting, you know, I'm not expect I'm not expecting like Chris Cook, who's because of his jobs playing once every you know once every couple of weeks. I'm not expecting like Ethan Taylor at 16 to start like walloping people. I want my leaders to lead, and that's the kind of thing that should be happening. Not just fighting for the sake of having a fight. That's the bit I. That's the bit I struggle with in in hockey. And I, I get it. I don't play, and it's one man's. It's one man's opinion, and people and people don't agree with it. That's it's cool. good to have different. It's but good fighting, to have different opinions. But yeah, but if you're gonna fight, fight for fight for you know fight for a purpose. And like you say, Pinky back in the day fighting Jesse Hamill. Like I say, all all round like talk about all time bonehead plays. But like you say, there's a if, if the camaraderie though. A reason, yeah. The camaraderie in the room though, when you when when you walk in and what the guy who just scored like 110 points a year before he got 100 points already at that point, and he's stepping up and he's like square go. Same thing, like and um, credit what Yarrow. Yarrow. I was I gonna... Yarrow Chesky, I wouldn't have t- I wouldn't have touched the barge He's got the Yarrow always had a look in his eyes like he could snap at a moment's notice. <laughs> Oh, he could. I'll get into a story about those two in a minute. I was a little fun, funny you mentioned Yara because he was the other one I went to brought up. Um, so he, if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. Swindon Wildcats taking on Slough Jets back in the day. Pete Russell, Swindon Wildcats coach. And you might see me fighting from the bench. Aaron Connolly, Sam Waller, my brother's in there. Everybody's in there. But what actually started that whole thing 
Ryan skated past the bench and out of nowhere, Yarrow two handed him off the bench. I'm sitting next to Yarrow. I'm like, this is a fuck. Oh, shit. Ryan's turned around and I'm like, normally, like, even though Yarrow was in the wrong, normally if someone skates at the bench, I'm like, right, I'm going to jump in there. Ryan skating. I'm like, fuck, dude, this is you, mate. Like, no, this, this is you until anybody else comes and then I can join in. But to Yarrow's credit, about three weeks later, he dropped the gloves with Ryan, squared off in Swindon. And it didn't go very well for him, as you would imagine. But it, when you have that, he comes back to the bench. He's bleeding and he's cut. You're like, yes, like you're fired up. You, your skill guy just went to went to battle for you. And call me dinosaur again. I'll say it again. I do not care. I still firmly believe it has a part in the game. Do I want to see? You know, Roman and Dor and Sharpie going toe to toe after fucking one second. No, do I want to see Kevin Bergen fighting Jason Robinson in the middle of a play? Fuck yeah, like every day of the week. Because you're talking guys that are top six guys that can eat minutes, but also tougher than a night in jail and can still bring that to the team. I, I don't want to see meatheads, but tough guys who can play. Tom Wilson, you've mentioned him already. He's a prime example. Here's a question though for Ben. And again, I'm sorry for folk for folk up north, but it's because you've got three southern based lads on one podcast. <laughs> because you watch a lot of you watch a lot of South One, and arguably the arguably two of the best fighters in that entire division are Ryan Watt and Brandon Miles, who've barely fought this year. Well, I mean, they're on the same team for one, so that that kind well, they're of not going to fight each other. Yeah, that might be a bit. Of... Well, that's, um, probably, that's probably practice now just for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's going to say laugh, Thursday, but... Thursday night practice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Brando's dance partner hasn't played this year in Bailey Chittick. Those those mm. two have had ding-dongs over the last few years. I like um, Bailey. Yeah, Bailey, Bailey's not played this year. But it's there's a lot of younger lads coming through in, in this division now. I know last season, Archie Salisbury had a little go at Brando, which, uh, which he said surprised him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it didn't go very well for him, but he tried. It didn't, no. He had a good go, but it, it didn't go very well for him. He was only 16 at the time. So, yeah, he, d- he did a good thing on it. But, no, it's not something we've seen a great deal of this year. I mean, obviously, without having Bailey at Chelmsford anymore, Kieran Rain is probably the other guy that does like a tilt. He's not really had that many this year, um, unless it's been required. Um, I think the last Britain Cup game down at Invicta, he, he rushed off the bench to to get involved. I think Eden Rolf had taken a, a big hit and he went and did what he does and defended his, his young player. But because of that, he's missing the postseason. So oh. we'll, we'll, we will come on to the DOPS, ladies and gentlemen. I, I know, <laughs> I know that I know that's what you're all expecting the three of us on here together. Um, before we, we kind of, obviously we've gone quite in depth for, with the national before we go into NIHL one, NIHL two playoff finals weekend this weekend, I wanted to ask you boys, is there any favorite standout moments for a positive reason? We'll go through them. And then once we've done that, we'll look at our more negative stuff that's happened throughout the year, because there's been a couple of little bits and pieces that, that have happened that we would probably like to see change. So, Positive ones first, boys. The the floor's yours. Whoever wants to take the lead on this one. I'm gonna have to consult my notes. <laughs> um, there's a couple there's a couple of things to me. There are three things that stand out for me really as big positives. Uh one is um is even though they didn't make the playoffs, I think Solway's debut season in the national division has been a a roaring success. Last it's taken it's been a build up over the course of the season, but they think about this. They dominated the North for ages. We're getting four or five hundred people. They got more people last weekend at the Sharks game than Queens did. And you yeah, think, I think about it was eleven twenty. Yep. Yeah, and think about how heavily ingrained football is into that part of Southwest Scotland as well, where you've got Queens, Stranra, and and you've got loads of clubs all kind of around there. And for the Sharks to beat. Um, to beat the local football team is pretty huge when you consider what that kind of build-up has been. But it's all the other bits and pieces as well. It's that kind of sort of, it's a bunch of teams that kind of have taken this this opportunity to just go, actually, you know what, we're here. And the Sharks are the best example of it. Oxford's on ice has been awful, but think about how much they've managed to generate to the point where they've had an extra 100 people on average buying pre-sale tickets That's to huge. watch 
to watch Oxford rattle it out at the bottom of South One. Like the Sharks are the best example of it, so I use them. The other positive, one of the other big positives, and I have to say this for them. Billingham Buccaneers in North 2. The Bucks started yep. out, this is their first year in, in North 2, and they had an absolute gong show. They had three games in a row not finish. One because the ice died, uh, because the, the ice died, and then the, the Zamboni died, and they couldn't repair the ice. And two, because of fighting. Like one game was called a good couple of minutes early, one was called inside the last minute. And they had to put out, they put, I, I, can't, I was chatting to a couple of people from the Buccaneers about it, and I was just like, you can't do this. This is, this is like slap shot come to life mentality. This isn't meant to be real life, lads. What are you playing at? And the Buccaneers, a few of them said to me, like, we're going to make a difference. We're going to change. And they put out this big statement saying that they were going to, you know, they took responsibility for what they'd done. They were going to do better and they did better. And I think that's actually something that kind of needs to be celebrated. They went, yeah, we've acted like idiots. We've done stupid stuff. This is not right. We are going to make a change here. We're going to get rid of the players that have been doing stupid stuff. And we're going to actually go out there. We're going to play hockey and we're going to do what we can to make the season the best we can do. Well, in the first time of asking, they're at Sheffield this weekend. And yeah. for me, that's massive because it's it's accountability for having made mistakes. It's restitution to kind of make better actions and they've got their reward now admittedly they're probably going to get pumped by Telford 2 on Saturday on Saturday morning <laughs> however but that's not the point right? hey at least you're if at the you, dance mate yeah exactly you've got both Billingham someone's got to teams. take the ugly bird home you've got both Billingham teams in Sheffield we pretty much were certain the stars were going to be there the Buccaneers you might have had a bit of a toss up but you know what they said they were going to they were going to do things right do things the right way and they did things the right way and they got rewarded for it the last thing they've got one of my old uh conference boys darren statusfield so uh he played down at oha i know i just saw he's actually he's back playing with the bucks so go on the bucks but the the last thing for me and i I will say this is the i've had i've had a really weird year where i've had no and i've just gone walking around kind of going uh, kind of going wherever and i will not i will not be a popular man for saying this the second leg of the South One Cup final between Streatham and Slough is the best game of hockey I have seen this year. It was, as a spectacle, phenomenal. Just the everything you love about this sport concentrated and distilled into 60 minutes. It was brilliant. It was, yes, there were things that you might want to change about it. What would have happened if Jack Goodchild had played because he was in concussion protocol that night? But what a game. And that, you know, the facility at Streatham, you know, it's not as new as it once was or anything like that. And yeah, the crowd at Streatham is a bit of an interesting one because it's got quite a transient nature to it. But in terms of what happened on the ice that day, I, I'm genuinely at a loss in terms of, you know, I've seen games at higher levels, games at lower levels, but uh, what a game. Just it, it, everything that you wanted out of a game of hockey and especially a game of hockey that had a real thing for you know like a, a cup final game it was it was brilliant i'm hoping that playoff weekend generates that similar sort of excitement but it was two really good teams butting heads and for the whole thing to be decided effectively by an empty net goal in the in the last couple of minutes it was just yeah i think it, it, I, I people keep telling me that hockey below the elite league isn't entertaining all the way get in the sea won't hear it from anybody ever again no, absolutely. I think Nick has got a problem with his contact lens. He's like he's nipped off to to the toilet. But the I, I can hundred percent agree with you from that cup final. It was just even following Chris's play by play updates on that game that was at Streatham. It was so enthralling. And and in all honesty, that was the two teams that deserved to be in that cup final as well. That they, they'd both worked the hardest to get there, gone through what they needed to go through to get there. As it was a, it was sort of half of the league to start with was the original format of it and then the top four from that is where we got the semi-finals and and I really gave Slough a, a chance that night I think as you say Mission Jack Goodchild on that second the second leg of it was a massive massive problem for them I think that could have could have well made the difference but um, yeah I'm, I'm the same with you I've watched a little bit of Elite League this year I've not seen a great deal of National League it's entertaining even down to, to South Wales it possibly probably even into the twos uh, listening to Listening to Lee Mercer on 4,000 counting with Nikki today, they've said the quality level's gone up. 
Yeah, that, that, that South has been a South has been a fascinating watch this year for the bits I've been able to kind of for the bits I've been able to get to that that Guildford Harringay game that I was at the Spectrum about uh, you know a couple of weeks ago was Is that we did the the spaces commentary on. Yep, yep. As I like to, as I like to remind people recently, I, I've broadcast as much domestic hockey this year through through my mobile phone and a twenty pound headset from Amazon that is slowly breaking as fire play. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the South, South two is, South two is uh, my thing for next year. I'm not, I don't really know what's happening with me next year at the moment, because obviously the summer is here. If I'm still back on my walk around, I want to get the North one. I want to get to North two. Cause you know, like Gosport versus Lee Valley. Me and Anne are so this. homeless right now. Yeah. Gosport, <laughs> Gosport, people, people People will look at Gospel versus Lee Valley and think this is this is ridiculous. I'll tell you what, I I had far too more fun than I had any right to at a game of that uh, a game of that level in this country. I'd rather stick a if fork I, in my eye. Oh, mate, watching. I tell you what, I'll remember nope. the name. I uh, hopefully there's gonna, nothing hopefully, you can say. Hopefully, he's going to press on <laughs> because I think I think if he if he reigns a few of his, if he reigns a few of his little eccentricities, he'll be very good. Tadger Allen at the Lee Valley Lions. Has got something about him. He does. He played in the four thousand counting. Yeah, played in four thousand counting yeah. uh, rep tournament, mate. Kids yeah. legit. He needs to stop skating into Chris Necrosivisis. That's well, probably not your well best. Well done for that. <laughs> but um, but he's that that lad is that lad. If he can if you can rein in if you can tighten up a few of the loose bolts that he's got, he's got potential to push on. I think he looked really really good. Also. Bless his mum. Every shift he was on the ice, keep skating, son. I was like, oh, you're the best. I love hockey mums. Hockey mums were amazing. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow that up. That in there? Mate, so yeah. she, if we kind of keep it under wraps, but it's been it, it, it happened long ago now. But there was a, a brawl in the charity game, and young T's took on Bandy. And they threw down. Um, fair play to him. I don't know why he picked on Bandy of all, all the people to have a fight with, but you know he did, and he did he did well. And afterwards, his his mum was like talking to me, and I was like, like I'm sorry, I explained what happened. And there was an incident, obviously a little bit of racism towards Norm. And then when I told him that, she was like mad. She went mad, and that's a scary lady when she's mad. You don't want you don't want to make her mad like. <laughs> Old fashioned telling off, mate. She gave him, and I was, uh, I was happy I was not on the on the end of it. <laughs> so sh- shout out, but yeah, mate, he can play. By the way, kids, kids, decent. He come through Harringay Juniors, and he's not getting a look in at any sort of senior level. He's gone Lee Valley. Good for him. Hopefully, he progresses. Excellent. Yeah. So my my three positive things from from this year, uh, echoing what Ant said. Obviously, the Solway Sharks thing, I think, is brilliant. Uh, Oxford's off-fire stuff has been fantastic. They're, the guy that's been doing their social media told me they've right. actually amassed more than one million social media hits this year, which for is you know, legit. third-tier hockey in the UK, that's that's incredible. Obviously, the signing of Petr Cech would have been a yeah. massive help to that. <laughs> I was going to say that will help. <laughs> Shout out Petr Cech, yeah. Um, my, my, yeah. Most famous, my most famous Twitter follower. Uh, yeah, oh, mine too. It, yeah, he doesn't follow me. <laughs> oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> Um, I and obviously echo in the the Slough Streatham Cup final w- was incredible, uh, but for me the the emergence of Brindley Caps is is a massive massive positive for, from this level and and from the national level as well, and um, the Basingstoke Buffalo, that's a big positive for me. Everything that's going on with that rink in this that town and the, obviously the Buffalo uh, the the Bison. Chelsea were benefiting massively from from the Bison not playing with a couple yeah, of the that, that we've got there, and um, King Romany just learning to drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lord has he learned has, to drive? Has he? Yeah, Lord, I dropped him in it. Holy shit! Yep, Jordan he, mentioned it on his interview with Ben the other the other week. I started oh, laughing. No. My, my son looked up from his tablet, confused as to why I was laughing so hard. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would do it. Yeah. Um, so three well, for I think me, that's great was... that they've made Sorry, the ben, final four. I think that's great that they've made the final four, and uh, I think yeah. the Bison fans will probably they'll they'll go with go to them, go with them. Well, they they are making me a what's the right way? Normally, I am super impartial, even Streatham. Like I'm not even really supporting Streatham this weekend, 
but I'm fucking supporting the Buffalo this weekend. Like yeah. I, 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 I'm full on, like no fence sitting, no impartiality. Yep. Fuck that. I want the Buffalo to win this weekend. I called them earlier. I, I believe in them. I called them earlier in my interview with Merce. We had a little prediction. Dan Weather Evans is going to shut the door. Adam Jones is the best player in that league. So someone put, I can't remember who it was. I put it on Hockey Freaks. He might be the best player in that league. No, he might not fucking he be is. the best player in that league. He is the he best is player best in player. that league. Yeah. It, there is there is no if, ands, buts, or maybes. The guy is, he's almost a division better than anybody else that's playing in that division. Um, to, to, to put it easy, like he is that, he's that far ahead. You then add Stampy. You don't know what Stampy's going to do. You got Howe's Howe's got seventy odd points this year. The game I watched every time he got the puck against Howell Peter was Brett, the top, dangerous. Hallam was the top point scorer in the division. Oh, okay, so that would make sense. So, Hallam, seventy five Hallam... points. Seventy five points, I believe, in twenty two so games. Twenty seven or twenty. It was either twenty seven or twenty eight games. I can't remember whether, whether really Hallam missed well. a game because yeah. Hallam, Hallam, of course, genius that he was, skipped their preseason game against Coventry to go on holiday. Yeah, he went on holiday, didn't he? I, yeah, I think I texted him points in twenty two games. 22. Oh, 22. I think yeah. I texted him and said, have a nice holiday, coach. <laughs> like, <laughs> enjoy that. Um, but yeah, so, and then you got Paul Petz undercover. The the one thing that obviously does hinder the Buffalo, they haven't had them all year, but it would have probably been nice to have them. Interesting to see how it pans out if this does make a difference. But hypothetically speaking, the Buffalo could put the Phoenix out on Saturday. The Chieftains could put the Jets out on Saturday and then on Sunday, the Buffalo are going to have Roman Kafka and fucking Oli Hemmings Mayer, which makes a difference to your hockey team. If they have that, they win the whole thing. The um, I can't remember off the top of my head whether they qualify for the playoffs. Those the only issue. They're so um, young; they must do surely. No, there's no there's no under 18s qualifier on the on the playoffs. You have to have played the games to qualify. Um, that Here was we the go. That they while brought. you while you're talking about that, I'm going to look up how many games they've played, and then we can try and wing it. Because I'm pretty certain they've not played enough. It's because the, that rule that the rule was brought in team. into the into the leagues the year. Um, if you remember, it was 28, it was 2017, 2018, where they scrapped the under 18s rule and they made the kids play the quality, they made the kids have to play the games so that teams below couldn't have ringers in. It resulted in the Swindon Wildcats getting 5 0 against Peterborough in the playoffs. The player responsible who put on the game sheet, Josh Kelly. Uh, Lovely so both, both of those boys, Roman and Ollie, have both played three games. And it's you not know, enough to qualify, unfortunately, not enough to qualify. Which actually, you know, what are we trying to do here? Because mm. and ultimately, because well, like, well, I'd rather watch those two boys play ice hockey on Sunday than not watch them play. <laughs> and we're trying to develop talent. Why? I get you want to make it fair, but if you lose because two seventeen-year-olds come into the roster, you deserve to fucking lose. No, I'm sorry. No. I'd much rather those I'll boys throw, go an extra game there. at a final in front of 1,100 people at Ali Paddy going mental. I'll throw this out there as well, though, because this is, and like I say, you know, yeah, sorry, we're getting a bit Bayesian Stoke centric for a minute there. So sorry. sue me. But the, um, sorry, suck it up. We haven't got to see a game all year. <laughs> like, yeah. Come on. But the, um, <laughs> but it's not just about, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, and, you know, people have gone to, games like the capacity they were allowed it was originally 100 it got upped a little bit more after that and yeah people know from from bison days of watching hallam paul stampy obviously tom banner came uh came banner, back yeah. as well uh adam jones the fact that adam is playing at all is, is, is just brilliant but you know what it's the other guys that have been grinding away it's morgan parsons getting time yeah. in net when dan was injured it's sam compton <laughs> it's the younger guys coming up like uh you know, like Freddie Stevens on Robinson, Cam Buckle still, you know, battling away down there in um in South in South too as well. Obviously, Sam Brooks has been has been hurt most of this year. I believe he's he sat the year because of injuries and the like. He, he had he, a he had a hip surgery yeah. tail yeah. end of the summer because I spoke spoke to him at the game I went to, and he I think just started skating, about to start skating, like but not obviously yeah. going to be back on the yeah. ice at any point this year. Yeah, but the, but this is about those guys as well. It's about you know forty something. Year old Yanni Vierton still <laughs> just living the dream, like smashing weights around, listening to Black, yeah, he's strong, mate. Listening to, Black, listening to Black Flag and and finish death metal, and then getting out there with a bunch of seventeen and eighteen year olds because they just love it. Like to be a Buffalo 
for years has been about, I love playing hockey, so I'm going to turn up. And Hallam and Paul have turned up, have professionalised the attitude of those boys. And you know what? It's not just been about, yeah, obviously, the first line's play more than the fourth line. But Paul and Hallam have turned up and they haven't just, it's not, they've not made it about them. They've dragged everybody with them. Who, who did they stick Jonesy on the ice with? Freddie Stevens. They didn't, the stick kids, him, yeah. didn't, stick, yeah, didn't stick him immediately with Tom Banner and just have those two just like play 35 minutes a night. They've dragged the kids through. You talk to Dan Weller Evans, the one thing he wants, how much ice time can I get Morgan? How much How much can I get him in net to see, to see some more pucks? And yeah, Dan's number one. You would not put Dan in as a number one in that situation. But all he's of ever said not. to me this year is about how much time he can, how many ways can he fit Morgan in? How many ways can he get Morgan ice? time and game time so that if something does happen to him like it did that the Buffalo could still go out there and still win games with, with Morgan in net because they would trust that Morgan could do could do the job I had the uh, exact same conversation with him at the game I went to mate the, obviously because he, I, I sat and watched a game with him he's in the stands he was like yeah. mate look at, look at the kid he's fucking he's good Don't, yeah. he can play yeah. he can do this but yeah F- fully colours fully colours to the mask I don't care and I, I, I yeah I sorry saying, folks I, I, I said last night, I have a lot of time for the Guildford Phoenix. The Guildford Phoenix gave them the opportunity to do something that they didn't have to do the other week uh, to to prove to prove that something could uh, to prove that something could work. I'm begging the Buffalo to win. I'm begging them to find the way to do this. Basingstoke never dies. Up the Buffalo. Don't you know? I don't don't care. I'll be I'll be gutted if they don't find if they don't find a way to do it. But Guildford are a really good team at that level. Harringay, if they can get them, Harringay are such a fa- they're such a fascinating team to watch. They're so much more than the sum of their parts, and they fell sh- against the Guildford team that is just a four line machine at that level. Um, and Peterborough, Peterborough are really interesting and can do a lot with very little. I saw them beat Solent with twelve skaters the other week. You know, both Pollard brothers flying around, Jordan Ho, who I'd never seen before. The guy's got. You know, he's got world championship experience with Hong Kong. Ryan Bainborough is very good. At yeah, he's that good level too. Like the Div, Div Two South play, uh, playoffs is like. Don't get me wrong. I want Basingstoke to win, but I think people, some Div One fans who don't watch Div Two, are going to be very, very surprised by what they're about to see. Same thing up in the north as well. That machine that is Tell the Tigers too are going to put on a show this they're week. Strong. I'm pretty certain mm. of it. And something I've said to a lot of people with the South One, because I know a few people have obviously not been overly happy about the location, the hotels, the parking, the whatnot. And there's a there's a concert going on in the other side of Ali Pali that night. Um, I believe Underworld are playing in the other side. They are, yeah. Quite quite late on. <laughs> what I said to the to people about that is no that gonna be driving to banging, that isn't it? <laughs> because they're not gonna be in the state to drive home. No. After they've been to that. Yeah, so no, I wouldn't worry yeah. about that. But if anything, it gives you an excuse to get there early. You've paid for a weekend ticket. Get come off. and see all of these games. Because Ant's right, you're right. They will put on a show. The the Guildford Basingstoke game I'm massively looking forward to. Haringey on their home ice. That that's going to be a great game against Peterborough. That's the only thing that has kind of surprised me. I was I was listening to you speak with Merce earlier as well. When they held the playoffs at Ali Pali last year, just for South Two, that sold out, and that sold out really quickly. Yes, this. I mean, this. We're two days away. There are still tickets available, and there's eight teams okay. going to play at this tournament. I, I didn't want to press it enough. I didn't want to press too much on Merce. I believe well. I, I didn't want to push Merce on it too much, but I believe there's like two and a half, three hundred tickets left, right? Mm. Which, if that is the case, it's very disappointing considering, as you say, they sold it out last year when it was just the NIHL two teams. The The combined thing is a risk. It could be massively beneficial, but that, that part of me just goes, let everyone have normal face-off times. These guys work all year to get to the finals, have two separate weekends. If you, if you, can do that if it's financially visa feasible to do that i don't want to fucking work 28 games to have to eat pasta at half six in the morning are you mm. fucking taking the piss or what like no like, i i want to have as, as, as someone who had to eat pizza at five o'clock in the morning in berlin the other week it's not as bad as it sounds people yeah you didn't have to play a hockey game after it though um no, and, into an easy jet fight yeah well there is that but it's as much as everyone like you say 
below the elite league, they think this. But bollocks, it's these guys' Stanley Cup. Like, that's what it is. It says Stanley Cup. So they they deserve the right to be able to prepare properly to to do the things that they would do on a game day. Yeah, your face-off might be, you know, two or three, but 10.30 for me as a player is a bit too early. Though anyone that's good at those levels will have experience of this because they would have played in conference tournaments, they would have played in England tournaments, they would have played in GB tournaments where you might be the early game on. Those that have only ever really played club hockey, they won't have experienced this since they were 10 years old. <laughs> like They would have been playing quarter four, six o'clock. That was the two junior slot kind of slots in Basingstoke. And then when you're an adult player, you're playing at five at the earliest, sometimes maybe four. But since Solway have been in the league, there's been a couple of them kind of face-offs. But for the majority, it was any time between 5.30 and 7 was kind of your face-off time. So your entire routine, everything you do from what time you should go to sleep the night before the game, what you eat the night before the game, what you eat, where you walk, what services you stop at, what coffee you drink, what what everything you, you fucking do is. And if you were... Something super, back now, seven hours. <laughs> yeah, like... It might not be able to do it. Players are going to have to change routines. It It is going to be a factor. Merce said he thinks that actually suits Basingstoke better than Guildford, which I found interesting. Yeah. I well, love Dan to death and I've known him since he was 15 years old. The amount of moaning, the amount of moaning he does, if it's not affecting him, he's not showing it very well. <laughs> yeah, right. What... Um, What's what's your predictions then, boys? I know uh, uh, Ben. Obviously, you got to do commentary, so if you don't want to give a prediction, that <laughs> is totally fair. I understand that because otherwise, you're in for a long day from whoever well, I've, you I've pick, been, pick I've, against. I've been being called an Essex Red Hawk on Twitter this year. Oh yeah, shit! This, this week, yeah. I mean, I'm shots I'm fired. Not, <laughs> I've always said to everybody, I'm not tribal. I never have been. I love sport. The irony of supporting a team called the Chieftains and saying you're not trying yeah. to just let that lurk in the well, air. Well, or the Red Hawks. I mean, the Red yeah. Hawks are just, yeah. just up, is up there as but well. But I've never been tribal. I support the team and, and I will be absolutely cock a hoop over the moon if the, Chel- if the Chelsea Chieftains take home the title on Sunday. But I've, I've loved sport media as long as I've loved sport. So I really do understand the importance of being impartial. And I always try to be impartial and see it from both sides. Uh, but yeah, re- recently, I've, uh, the amount of stick I get of people saying I'm a closet Streatham fan or oh, I'm a closet Slough fan, I just I just love the game. <laughs> so for me, though, they're, they're the best two teams in that division, no matter whether leagues, cups, whatever. I, just from, from what I've seen this year, they've been the best two teams. And if you're, well, like we always try to be impartial doing this, if you go and watch these games and there's good other teams, why would you not like watching good other teams? I, I don't understand. Like, you like the sport, right? Mm. Why? What, what is your issue to go and say, you know, like, I'm a Sheffield Seer. Wow, that Northern Panthers game was really good. That was entertaining. I enjoyed that. Like, that that was a good hockey game. Yeah, it does, Not everything has to be pure hate. Because like, obviously this year, as I, as I touched on, myself and Ant, we're homeless mate like we're, yeah. we don't have a, we don't have a saturday shift so that has sent us to some obscure locations across the uk and europe and for me i've got to embrace fan culture in czech in denmark um sweden germany um slovakia all over the place yeah and luckily for me because of the way i am and how i like to get in amongst it I've got to go in the fan curve or the fan zone or like the standing section for pretty much most of the games that I've been to. Obviously got hooked up on off the chart experience in Cologne. Shout out my boy Fergie over there, Guildford Flames, getting that sorted for me where I got the box, which was mad unexpected. The best experiences though, eight euros in Bruno to stand in the fan curve. And then just go ham for an hour and a half, uh, two and a half hours, whatever it was. Uh, where else did I go that was cheap? So Prague, again, we, we were in the fan section in, well, but just behind the goal. Prague in the in the extra league, uh, 9.35, 8.35, 8.35 was the ticket. Three, three rows back. 
but getting in amongst it, Germany, and obviously I was chatting to him while I was out there. I was texting, you know, I was at the, like at the wall and then doing doing bits and pieces, and I, I hadn't actually realised Ant's entire background of knowing German. Like he always talked German shit, and I'm like, oh yeah, he fucking knows a lot about <laughs> knows a fucking lot about Germany. This guy, but while yeah. I was away, he was it like filling me in. I was like, ah, that makes sense. How long were you there? Uh, I only lived there for about a year because. Um, but you studied you, it for uni- how long? Uh, I started learning German uh, year first year of secondary school, so nineteen nineteen ninety five. I started le- I started learning German, and it's now twenty is now twenty twenty four. Uh, I'm off to, the wife and because actually uh, the wife and I turn both turned forty this summer, so we're off to Vienna, uh, and we're taking the boy. Yes. So the boy is currently on a run of asking uh daddy what's this word in german what's this word in german what's this word in german uh which is great for me yeah i mean i've not obviously not gone as gone that far abroad this year although i did manage to get to hockey in berlin in the straight daftest weekend of my life um but yeah even for the fact of of just sort of silly little bits and pieces like what 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 was it? It was the fourth division reg- regional league os so os- eastern regional league playoff first round. Um it sounds like then, something you would tell the missus you were going to when really you're going down to the fucking pub with the lads, you know. Yeah, you baby, know it's like the, it's the fourth division regional semi final, quarter final dash thing about something else. Thing is, I'll tell so the story of this weekend because I obviously wrote up the game because every game I go to, I do the write up or I do the, the little audio report. But I won this football experience weekend. It's basically like a oh, yeah, mystery football that. weekend. And it progressively I just went to things with less and less people in it. Friday night, Olympic Stadium in Berlin, Hertha Berlin, so second division German football, Hertha Berlin versus Kiel, 45,000 people. Next day, Babelsberg versus Dynamo Berlin, uh, fourth division German football, 4,000 people. Saturday evening, fourth division German ice hockey, Four like literally four hundred people, um, and I paid nine euro. I paid nine euro to get in, and and they made they they were making fresh crepes and fresh waffles. So I was like, oh, I'll have one of these. He's Let's just going to stick it in a microwave. And he's like, no, gets the batter out of the fridge, pours it in, cooks yeah, it. I'm stood go. there waiting, like, looking like a chump, just like, oh, I didn't realise this was like actual effort involved. And then ha- like covers it in powdered sugar, hands it over and just like, yeah, all right, this is this is different. Well, I'm trying to remember the final score for that game. 11-2. And even then, here's the stupid bit about that. Fourth division German and German league playoffs. Seven game series. Of course it is. That's what they do, mate. <laughs> beautiful stuff but yes this weekend this weekend what's going to happen uh, are you making a prediction Ben or are you, be, no, are you I'm, being no I'm polite? not going to make a prediction I'm just going to hope that we get he's four... going full Michael Bisping he's just going to sit on the fence because he's yeah, got four commentate. incredibly entertaining games no overtime because the schedule is tight as you like as it is That's I love that as well the fact that I think a game's going to be two hours is hilarious yeah, well, Blaine get... riffing all of it let's get no um, and uh, Elmer, and, and Elmer I just hope that the weekend goes off without a hitch. You know what? It's I think I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's a great idea. Obviously, four games in one day is is a, is a push. But I just how would the ice goes. handle it? That's the question. Mm. Yeah, I just hope it all goes like, off. And this a is a, this is a question that nobody's asking, and it's a question as a player. In that fourth game, if you're expecting Slough Jets and Chelsea to be playing nice fucking ticky tacky backdoor passing. Mm, that ice is going to get chewed up mm. with three fully fledged adult playoff games going. That is going to take nine periods of a beatdown plus yeah. potentially overtime. We know these games; these games should be tight, lads. So they they could potentially be overtime. Mm. It is going to screw the schedule. I don't know how it's going to work for folks uh, getting trains back. So if you're getting a train back, and you know the games. The eight o'clock game doesn't face off until nine. It goes to OT. You're flirting with midnight. And if you've then got to bounce into central London to get your train from Waterloo or Clapham or wherever, Victoria, wherever you're going. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting for some folks. Lucky Baines, though. I think we're like, I don't know, 145 last train or something like that back. Yeah. I'm, but I'll, I'll, I'll work my way through it then. So, Basis at Guildford, 
three to Buffalo. I'm going to throw that Let's out go. there. Buffalo. Let's go, in. Buffalo. Um, Streatham over Solon because as much respect and as much time as I have for Alex Murray uh, and the boys and the boys from Gosport, I Ben Painter is on something this year. And I, like I've said, I've said I've said the story a lot, and I'll say it again. When they lost the finals of Solway last year, I didn't record the interview. We just had a chat, but you could see in his eyes that the gears were turning in his head already. And the um, yeah, so Stratham over Solom. I'm going to be mildly controversial here, and it's only because they could nearly coughed up last weekend, and they did cough it up at home. Peterborough over Haringey. Um. I think I think that's the game of the that's the game of the weekend. I think that goes to OT. Um, if I'm a hundred percent honest, interesting. But I um, interesting. I think it's the next one. Uh, I I but I will call this. I will no. I'm actually calling this one, and I think it's. I think this is down to a mentality thing because I think they will refuse to be denied. Uh, in the in the moment, slough over Chelmsford. Um, I my, believe that's what I went earlier. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, yeah, no, you my, did. My, it. My, my, issue, my issue with Chelmsford is in the really big moments this year, they have shown to be really inconsistent. Same thing with Harringay. That's why I'm calling Peterborough over Harringay. Is to you can say second, you know, it's the playoffs. It's the second season that the regular season doesn't matter. But you don't go to the you don't go to the track and suddenly believe the five hundred to one horse is going to beat the ten to one horse on that front. You do have to call the form book a little there. So I have I have Basingstoke. Avenging the nonsense of the cup semi final over Peterborough on the Sunday, um, and then I have Streatham sweeping the South and beating Slough on the Sunday. But I do think they, I do think both those games end in regulation. Um, but it's funny one. you say about Basingstoke and Peterborough and the shenanigans because the only game that I have seen in the NAIHL two this year is Basingstoke Peterborough. And it is the week after the cancellation, the league game that didn't really need to be a league game could most certainly have been the second leg of the cup. Yep. People were missing players. <laughs> they weren't even fucking close, mate. If, ba- if that Bainstoke team plays that Peterborough team, they will get, Bainstoke will pump them. Well, I think the difference there was pump that them. a bunch, uh, yeah, a, 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 bunch of, a bunch of those Peterborough lads, understandably, because they'd all committed to do that that weekend for the semi-finals. Once it became clear that the Phantoms were going to make it, they all were ready for that weekend, knowing the following weekend, a few of the boys they were like, right, I need to take a break, so I've got to do life stuff. Real life. Um, and the and certainly one of the things was was like, well, we're we're ready. You weren't ready. I was like, you've chosen to have a holiday. They didn't choose for the rink to fall to pieces. Who's that on? Um, and I've said that to Nathan. I've said that to Nathan Pollard as well. You know, and it's like, you know, we we agreed, we just agreed to disagree on that one because we're adults, and that's how that works. Um, <laughs> north up north is a bit of a tougher one. I have Billingham beating Whitley in OT. Uh, I've te- let's face it, North two Telford are winning the whole lot. Like, yeah, I think so. With all due respect to you know, Coventry have made the playoffs for the first, made the playoff weekend for the first time in ten years. Um, Sutton have been the bridesmaid over the, being the bride, but the North two final is going to be Telford versus Sutton, and Telford are going to win. That's pretty much where that is. I can't see past the um, I can't see past the Tigers not sweeping that one in the North. I'm going to be mildly controversial. Blackburn will beat Solihull. And then I think Blackburn will beat Billingham in the final. Um, because Producer think... Graham would be happy if that's the case then. So he'll be nice to be around next they, weekend. They, at the they did win the Dickin in the League Cup final, didn't they? Mate, by the way, is that, is that the most... Thing in aggregate. Is that the most fucked up thing that's happened this year? I, I that that I by the way, this is no disrespect to Blackburn. Blackburn can beat Billingham, but just the sheer the annihilation score yeah. the score line. And uh, Graham said it was Adam Barnes show. He said he was disgusting. Yep. And then when you think about Adam Barnes playing at Leeds last year and how good he was in the national and what he could do to a national game when he felt like it. Fuck knows what you're gonna do that in IHL one north, but evidently it is rip it a new one. Yeah, let's put this into perspective. Billingham, Billingham have had the easiest with all. Due, I can I still like hear the, the Nottingham Lions, bless them. Billingham 
walked over them in the quarterfinal, as you'd expect. But if you include that, Billingham have won, I think it's four of the last 11. That's not the form of a team that's going to win in the playoffs. No, no, they've had um, a bit of a dodgy end of the year. Like yeah. They stuttered to wrap the title up. Which has happened before. Like when Telford won the national division, it was them and Swindon pretty much running to the end. It felt like the two of them were tripping over their own shoelaces before Telford eventually won it ahead of the pandemic. But the, for me, and you know, because I, I had a chat to Craig Simpson, of course, Great Britain uh, media chap. He's obviously over in Latvia at the moment with the, with the GB women. Um, and I remember sending him a question because I wanted to check something with him. And he just goes like, have you got, I just need to ask you, I just need to get your opinion on something. Can you drop me a line when you're free? And his response to me back was, if you can, if it's why our form is so bad, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think Billingham will be, I think Billingham will sneak their way past Whitley just because Whitley over the course of this year, I just don't, they just don't seem to be able to do enough. They've in, been like this. Being, yeah. They don't seem to be able to do enough in, with, with enough consistency and I think Billingham's roster I think is just better but I think like I said by I the think... way they had me with that April to- Tony Hand April Fools I was like fuck it why not bring the OG back he's had, he's had his heart stitched back together like, let's get him out there he's got to be good for like he's got to be good for like eight points over the weekend still he's not that much older than Drew Campbell but um the <laughs> true story um, yeah true story but, but um but yeah I just I just think that it sounds horrible, doesn't it? But like Blackburn have got their number. How much more of a mental advantage do you need? Like, right, over two games, we shipped 20 goals in a weekend against this team. We now need to beat them once inside 60 minutes when we have Bring back Stephen Foster. <laughs> let's, might, get Fozzie, you, let's get Fozzy in between the pipes. Let's go. You might, put him, you might put, have to put himself in at some stage. But yeah, I had so Billingham to win the uh, Blackburn to win North one, Telford to win North two, Streatham to win South one. And because I'm a, and because well, you guys can talk about being impartial or commentary all you want. I don't believe there's such a thing as impartiality. I come with all my biases and prejudices. What I will do is I will analyse fairly, and I don't care when it comes to South Two. Basingstoke never dies. I'm with you. I'm with you. What do you think about the national uh, weekend then? Streatham against Billingham. Streatham. I think Streatham are fucking I annihilate Streatham. Um, with with all with all due respect. I so, sorry. Uh, is, uh, shout out Andy Finn. Sorry, buddy, but I think you're getting your pants pulled down, buddy. Stephen Foster deserves a lot of respect within the game in this country for everything he's put into it. Love and Foster. Billingham, over the course of the campaign, are rightly champions of that league because they were the because irrespective of the wonky end, they were the best team for the majority of it. I don't think. You know, ben Painter sacrificed points on that roster this year in South London because of heartbreak one year and heartbreak the and heartbreak the year after. He made them more defensively responsible for this moment. And I'm not saying this because Ben's a mate and because he lives down the road, because uh, he lives down the road from me. But genuinely, having I love ben. having having watched as much sort of tape as I can of Billingham, because obviously, despite the fact that you know, like Carol and and uh, you know, and, and people want me to seem to seemingly to drive up to live in Billingham, and I've already driven to Dumfries this year. I don't think Stretton will be denied. I genuinely think that Ben Painter has built a roster for this moment, and the one thing thing that what, Billingham oh, is there? I was the last couple I, of years I, I was they like, were not battle tested. Is it? But but Stretton were not battle tested the last couple of years. The biggest benefit for Stretton this year was Chelmsford got better and Slough got better because it meant that they actually got tested. They really, really got tested. And Billingham had been tested this year and buckled and buckled massively. Blackburn did them in. Solihull had done them in a couple of times this year as well. They lost to Hull and shout out the Hull Jets. Best best yeah. home record, record, worst away, away record in the blooming country at some times it felt like. But the national game... And this was the thing. It's in 2022, everybody said, oh, Streatham are going to beat Solway easily. And Solway pissed over them. Like there was no, like Ross Murray must have been laughing himself stupid after that one. Strew and Tonner like, well, like tweeting out Game of Thrones references after the 2022. Oh, shout out Strewin, by the way. I uh, I think he low-key retired, right? 
I, he, he might well have done. If he has, I'm going to be massively disappointed But because I love Strum. But yeah, Billy, uh, national final, Strum. And I know I know people have said it before and said it again, but I can't see... like Ben, ben Paint, I don't know what Ben Painter will do. His head might explode if they, if they don't win. <laughs> But paint, but paints has put that roster together in the, in the best, best. My brother life. wants that trophy, mate. Like that's too obviously he missed the first. I think the he first the year first was one. kind of you. That first year was kind of a wash. You can't have Vanny and my brother sitting in the fucking stands and and call it like the best of Streatham versus the best of Solway. The second year, Solway outclassed them, much better team. But that's that's two in a row. That's when you've won every other trophy for the last three years, that one's going to sting and it's going to sit there and the rest of them aren't going to mean shit. Cause this is the one you don't have. And this is the one you want. I can't see him being denied this year. Excuse me. Danny Milton's stats are a sick joke. They're, the, they're um, incredible. He's been unbelievable. Absolutely. Wait, I've got it here. In fact, right, right in front of me. <laughs> also to put it into context. 90, 94.7, 1.65 GAA, and he has nine shutouts. Nine shutouts right. across the season. Is that good? Uh, by the way, that 94.7 is in the league. That's just uh, the league, four, yeah. five shutouts in the league. I believe actually, when you add his combine his cup stats, it takes him up to like a 95.7 or 95.9. Either way, he's not letting shots in, which when it comes to playing ice hockey is pretty fucking handy. Mm. They've really spread the points around that. It's pretty handy, well. like. No I will only, I will only like interject. Points. I will only interject just because obviously this conversation, the conversation we've had over the course of this, because I've just had a, I've just had a message from from an honourable member of this parish, uh, a, a, a Mr. D. Clapman. Holy shit, Swindon haven't made it in ten years. Fuck. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Says. Yeah. Dave, mate, you're another year older. I'm another year older, and those years get further and further away. The Norman Chockey fight, God, the Norman Chockey fight now. God, that's yeah. my first year in Slough. Two thousand. Next year is going to be twenty years since Norman Chockey fucking threw down. That's when you know you're getting old because I remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> Blow, blow by blow, I remember them trying to bite each other, trying to headbutt each other, trying to shirt each other. It was the most crazy commentary moment. And as I've said on the podcast numerous times, every player, you are welcome. This is why you don't have to play the third and fourth on Sunday anymore. You are welcome. <laughs> that This is why. You have a brawl of probably the best order in the UK that we've seen in a long time, Norman Chockey. And then you have the worst goalie fight that you've ever seen in Moffat and Dobson to finish the day. And I think the league probably looked at it and went, right, that's probably enough of that. We're done. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Back on Stretton though, like you say about Danny, Danny Milton, Sorry. Danny's stats aside, put last year into context, right? Losing the national final for, for Stretton, that was their third loss of 22-23, their third loss. Streatham had lost three games by Christmas this time around. I'll show you two games, right? Because they've lost three. How many have they lost now? So they lost Not the many, Chelsea the other week in the shootout. Lost. It's either three or four off the top of my head. But that Streatham side looks better prepared, better drilled. And like I say, the best thing that has happened is to Streatham is Lucas Smith or making those kids suddenly just all come out of their shells all at the same time. And Cliff... Um, and Cliff making channels are just that much better. Yeah, Strat Stratham took five defeats in the league this year. Two, well, one in overtime, one in a shootout. Yeah. One, one, one was at week, wasn't it? We talk about injuries and stuff like that, but you know, some certain teams use an excuse. Stratham had injuries this year, and I know old man River there with his fucking old man hips was was on, on the surgery table again. But he, my brother's come back. He's in good form. Ziggy, he's tearing it up. But I think from watching from afar, undoubtedly the steal of, of the year is picking Luke Brittle back up. People sleep on Luke Brittle. I played against Luke mm. when he was a kid in Telford. He is a brittle. They are good at hockey. Like they have been good. Adam was good. Adam was outstanding. Um, boys, I know we've been here quite a while. I've got a couple of subjects written down that we, we ought to get to. So I, I, I will push on. 
Go Let's on. go back to to one of the to the points that you you brought up earlier. Kieran Brown being exceptional. Well, you didn't actually mention him. You said Leeds players being exceptional, yeah. but Kieran Brown is obviously the one that's first and foremost. The GB squad got announced to to play against Romania, to play against China, and to play against Serbia. I went to the Serbia game. I had tickets for the game after, but after the Serbia game, I had seen enough. I decided I am going home. I don't want to fucking watch that um, because it was quite frankly one of the worst ice hockey things I've ever... It was, I think said on the podcast at the time, it was like a bunch of year 11s playing against a bunch of year 7s at football on a fucking playground prison rules. Um, it was that, like, that disparity... Why Kieran Brown wasn't in the squad for that tournament, I don't know. He would have scored goals against Romania. He would have scored goals against China, and he would have most certainly scored goals against Serbia. It would have been a perfect bedding-in situation. Um, they brought Benny Davison, don't get me wrong. I love Benny. I think he did a great job. He, he's not a like-for-like -like replacement for Waller. Obviously, they play a different game. You're going to get a lot more offensive upside for Waller uh, from um, Waller than you would Ben Davis. But Ben, he still scored points in that tournament. So this is a takeaway from him. But what I've liked more recently about the NHL, you know, a third liner goes down. They call the third liner up from the AHL. They don't call the first liner up and fucking screw him in there and like square pegs round holes. They, they, they call up a guy like for like. Now, if you're going to lose Josh Waller, that late on and everybody else is already called up. The next person you call is Kieran Brown. Like he is the next person on the list. There is, there's three people on that list and this including the entirety of the rest of that GB squad, my friends included. I'm sorry if I offend you, but there's three players on that list and it's Josh Waller, Liam Kirk and Kieran Brown. And there is no other players on that list that are that type of player. There is just, there isn't there. We don't have three players that skillful, that prolific and I I would argue that would have been the time to bring him in. But even now going into the world, fuck it, take a gamble on him. The guy scored nearly 400 points in the last 150 games. You don't do that by accident. I don't care if you say the step up's massive. Yeah. The step up is massive, but you've got to give the guy a chance. Yeah. You've got to see if he can do it. That's, that's the thing. You, you're never going to know otherwise. And it was similar. I think Ollie Endicott got a little run out with Coventry blaze. Uh, in the elite league this he year, did, yeah. this year just gone, and and that's because and from from people I know at Coventry, obviously we know Scotty Findlay on three on three yep. is Coventry plays guy. Said that Ollie did quite well, didn't look out of place. Well, Ollie's got that feistiness about him, and he he'll battle. I think he's a, he's a long way off the GB senior squad. I think he's got to establish himself more in the national. I mean, I've had Ollie on here. He spoke great. He's a great lad. Um, but when we're talking people who I genuinely think can make a difference, and what what I break it down to, we're not, and and for accuracy's sake, I'll, I'll try and pull up the group now. But we are not expected to be going to tournaments and beating Sweden and Finland and Canada and whoever. But if we have any chance of wanting to get out of of these world championships and well, not out of stay in the, the world championships, we've got to be beating the teams in and amongst us. So this year it's a, maybe arguably a harder task than we've had Switzerland, Nor Norway, um, Denmark and Austria. And then, you know, we've got Czech, Czech are going to be a wagon. Finland are going to be a wagon. Canada Denmark are going and to be Austria a... are the two. Denmark and Austria are the two, are the two ones. Mm, and potentially okay. you can look towards Norway as well, in, in my opinion. The thing was that... The thing Need is, goals so, though, the, Ant, right? Yeah. That's, that was where my point is. The conversation with Brown, though, goes, goes around in circles uh, with things. And this is like... And people will accuse people will accuse me of being pickheaded about it, just like I will accuse people uh, elite league uh, folk about being pickheaded about this as well. Kieran Brown has three back to back hundred plus point seasons, right? Irrespective, comfortably hundred point plus, yeah, yeah. Irrespective of irrespective of the gap, and there is a gap between the national division and Huge. the elite league. There needs to be he needs to be looked at. The following, the, the, the same thing always comes back. If he was good enough, he'd be able to do it in the elite league, to which the response comes back the other way. What point is there a Kieran Brown sitting on the fourth line in the elite league when it is not his game, not his role? He should be a top six forward 
anywhere he goes and he wants to be paid to play ice hockey and make his living playing ice hockey not be paid enough not be paid paper round money to do a man's job which i don't think is unreasonable one of the things i've seen back the other way was oh but the gap, the gap is, is far too big. Look at the difference of what, what Jason Hewitt did in the Elite League to what he did in the National. Because I his, hate role, that is, his <sighs> role is different. And I'm sorry to get like really angry about this, but it's there is a there is a blind spot from a lot of people who watch solely watch Elite League and don't watch anything else. And you're right, I probably have a blind spot because I've not watched as much Elite League as other people over the last couple of years. That's on me because of what I because of what I choose to cover. But when you have a player able to do that much, like I remember as a kid watching Steve Bull play for England whilst playing for Wolves in the old second division. If you've got the quality, if you've got the ability, and if you genuinely believe the kid is the future, find a way. Find a way. Like, yeah, GB might have prep, uh, might have um, you know camp and might have warm up games the weekend of of the national division playoff weekend or spoiler alert, unless he gets really badly hurt, wait for the guy. Like what, you know, think about how many players, America, Czech, Canada, all the other top tier nations are going to pull in once their teams drop out of the NHL playoffs. Yep. Waiting for somebody and letting him join the team a bit later isn't really a problem. And this notion that, that Brown needs to prove himself at elite league level to be worthy of being in the national team is a bit fanciful because if you've got a set of eyes, you can see that the quality is there. But what you do have to do with Kira Brown is you have to put him, you have to set him up to succeed. It was like when Aaron Nell was in the elite league. And I still maintain that Aaron Nell never got a proper, never got used right. Never Never got got used used properly in the, in the elite league because you don't, you don't use a Porsche to pull your caravan up Snowden. You play players for their game. And if you do that and you set them up to succeed, they will succeed. I've spoken to lots of guys, and I won't sort of name names to you know for, for the sake of sort of save, uh, sparing their blushes. But I've spoken to a lot of, of players over the last year, and it's like oh, I'd really love the opportunity to do this. I want to do. I want more special teams. Time. I want to be on the power play more, or I want to do this. And it's just like get good at your role, choose the player you want to be, because you will get jobs based on the, being on really good yes. at what you are good at. If you have got a shot. Where you can't even where you can't even find the plexi, let alone the top corner. Don't say to me you want to do, be the shot on the point on the power play. Yeah, you ain't, ain't going to be the offside one time ago. No. So please, people, stop saying to me that Kieran Brown needs to prove himself in the elite, in the elite league. Why is he going to go and sit on the bench and play five? You know, you know what? Sit him on a bench and play him five minutes a night. If you play him on the top line for five minutes a night, because if you play him in the way that he plays, he will prove he will provide what you need him to if you put you don't Brown, accidentally score 61 goals you don't do that by a fucking accident no uh you just don't and i think this and like i say it's the it's the circular nature of the conversation i think that kind of, that kind of gropes me because ultimately kieran's an adult he, kieran brown has earned the right to make whatever decisions he wants about his hockey career me personally i would encourage him to get out of Britain and go and play on the continent somewhere. Because I think he could easily walk into a team in, in, in France or the Alps league or something like that. And absolutely. I think he can play in the Dell too, mate. I and do you know what, do you know what the most shocking one to me was this year mm-hmm. when I was away and of every standard, mm-hmm. like, I think he could slot in the fucking Czech extra league, no problem. Like because you know what a lot that Czech extra league is? It is a lot of very, very, very talented players who do nothing wrong, right? So when you have two teams of twenty guys who do nothing wrong, you know, like your fourth pair in D men are zipping tape to tape passes across the neutral zone at fucking 80 mile an hour. They're hinging, they're coming underneath, they're throwing long bomb breakaway part. This is your fourth pair of D men. You've got a fourth line winger who grinds, he does whatever. You stick Kieran Brown. I'm just thinking, if I could put Kieran Brown on the ice with those four hockey players and they give him the puck where he likes to get the puck, you'll score goals. Like, I'm telling you, you give the kid the puck, he can score. Like, mm. 
Yeah, the goalies get better. Obviously, they do get better. So the goal production might come down slightly. Yeah. It might come down 50%. But if his goal production comes down 50% from the National League to the Elite League, yeah, but he the, will have 30 goals, 30 goals in the Elite as League. As a British which, player. Yeah. No, yeah, which this year, the top scorer in the Elite League scored 32 goals. So if his scoring drops 50%, playing good amount of ice time... Based on this year, he's going to be in the top five scorers. I want to put something to Ant as well, because obviously Ant knows this man very well. Luke Ferrara, he finished the year on 50 goals. I think when we look at comparisons for Kieran Brown, um, Luke Ferrara is a good spot to look at. Well, Luke played 54 games this year, 50 goals, 56 assists, 106 points, two-year contract, ready to go. Kieran Brown, 52, 61, 61, 122. Ross Venus, another one in and amongst the Elite League last few years, 47, 30, 31 in, uh, 31 plus 72 in 47 games, 103 points, career breakout year for him. And then finally, bringing in the Ninth place in the top 10 scorers of the national was John Dunbar. We know the points Dunbar's put up in the elite league over four or five seasons. 23 plus 71, 94 points in 54 games. Kieran Brown is scoring more points than these guys. So when we're talking about trusted elite league veterans, Luke Ferrara, Ross Venus, John Dunbar, what makes you think this fucking kid can't do it? I don't understand. Like, how can you write him off? The thing that worries me, and Ben's point, it pointed out a really, really good example of a young player that's going to do an awful, make an awful lot of noise. Brindley Caps, right? Yeah. If Brown can't find a feasible way to play top flight British hockey in his game, where is the hope for Brindley Caps? Where is the hope for TJ Anderson? Where is the hope for Tommy Spraggan? Where is the hope for. Great point. Uh, if, uh, you know, for 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 you know, Finn Braden. Think about Finn Braden. Think Love, about that level of progression. By the way, for Finn Braden from Billing give, from Billingham Juniors through to the Stars, through to through to the Knights. That kid is the business. That kid. Give me fifteen Finn star. Bradens on my team, by the way. Yeah, and he, and but then you also think about a player like Finley Ulrich, right? Good, and really Finn, good. And Finn, yeah, and, and and you know what? Finley Ulrich is playing in the is playing in the Elite League, playing his role. But for some reason, people don't want to be don't want one of the most naturally gifted British goal scorers of his generation. The ability to do that whilst also earning a living. I saw a comment earlier today and I can't remember who it was from. He needs to think more about his career and less about the money or spoiler alert. (laughs) If ice hockey is your job, that is the same thing. And. This notion that these young lads have to make themselves destitute to get the opportunities is bonkers. Like what literally it makes no sense. The elite league, the elite league is a professional league. If your guys are having to get second jobs to make ends meet, you are not a professional league or you're at least not doing professionalism very well. And there's a bunch of other young like British players who are obviously getting the opportunities. Mason Alderson and Kel Beattie at Belfast, two, re- uh, two really, really good examples of especially someone like Kel who's come through the, the junior giants and things like that. Um, like I said, Finney Ulrich is there. But guys being used to their strengths, used in their, ro- used in their roles, right? If you play them to their strengths, unsurprisingly, they succeed when they get given yeah, the structure around well. them. But nobody, wants, but nobody wants to give Kieran Brown the opportunity to to be a top six forward in the elite league because he hasn't earned it. Well, I'm sorry if you score three back to back hundred plus point seasons in this, uh, in this league, I don't know what else he has to earn. Yeah, um, he's, he's earned it. It's, it's bizarre on that front. The, um, it's a, it is sorry, a Ang, can I just chuck one thing on top of that? It's your <laughs> show, Nikki. <laughs> yeah, I know, but we're all friends here. One thing I want to add on top of that. He's a fucking winner. Winners win. Like, all the individual accolades are great. They don't mean shit if your team don't win. And guess what? His team win. Back-to-back titles. And that's I want that when I... Roster ...that's arguably not as good as last year's. Nowhere near as good as last year. With year's. all due respect to Sam Gospel, who is ridiculous, and Matt Hayward, who... And Matt Hayward is a massively underestimated... Low-key 85 well. points, by the way, this year. Yeah. But 
in a team that got that has not got the best defence in the league by any stretch in terms of its blue line core, in a team that's had imports in and out this year for, ver- for various dif- for various different reasons. Even yeah. last year, you losing Cooper at later stages to Belfast, yeah. like that's huge. Team back and the kid, the kid does the kid does the business, and he's not perfect. There's defic- there's deficiencies to his game. There's an argument you can make about his two way game, but it's like back in the old days of the elite league. You didn't sign Greg Chambers to back check. Nope. <laughs> you didn't. You don't sign the Bart. You don't sign the Bartlett boys to sit. You know. You don't sign the Bartlett boys for finesse. You don't sign. You know. You don't, <laughs> you don't sign don't. Danny Milton to be Martin to be Manuel Neuer. You sign guys to do a job. And the fact that the people won't sit, and because apparently he somehow needs to go spend, you know, a, a half a season on the fourth line crashing and banging and he hasn't done that at the elite league level and for some reason hasn't scored 50 points from doing that means he's not ready for the opportunity and it's just like I, I don't know how many other how many different ways to have this conversation so for us then I boys to punch myself in the face so for us boys it's a it's a re- resound uh resounding yes that he should be amongst it one other name the only other name that I really feel that deserves to be chucked into the mix that I kind of feel has been left out is Kieran Long. Now, I'm not going to get into Pete and Kieran's personal issues from EPL days, but there was stuff back then. But I would like to have thought that both men, now family men, you know, both are young guys and no kids and stuff like that. Both uh, adults, they're fully grown ass men. They are dads, they are professionals, and they are both good at what they they do. I feel Kieran Long deserves a shot at the fucking Great Britain setup. Like he's we talk about winners. There's a guy that's got a trophy cabinet full of full of trophies from his time in the EPL to his time in Belfast. The guy's got winners' medals. And you know him very well from your time in Bain so should the man be in the GB squad. A couple of years ago, I would have said he was undeniable. The issue for Kieran Brown on in April Kieran Long. twenty four for Kieran, sorry, Kieran Long, yeah, Longer yeah. should have been in the when he was the top British goal scoring forward in the elite league. He should have been in Manchester the, in the squad. Absolutely no question about it. At the moment, given the role that he plays for Belfast, who does he replace now? I think is probably the question that I don't Ooh. think is unreasonable to ask. Let um, me have a look, and you're going was, to put me in a awkward when position because I'm going to answer really, it. When he was really, when he was at the at the absolute zenith of his game, and he was being used as that sort of middle sit, that sort of middle six scoring forward with a bit of a physical edge, um, he he yeah, but he should have been in the roster every single year. At Belfast, because he's obviously you know, and to to for Kieran's full credit. He's, he's even played D, life, right? He's he's rounded his life out. He's turned into the Belfast version of Tony Redmond and just playing every every position he gets asked. Sort Great of probably, analogy, by the way. Play, you'll play. You'll end up playing in goal probably at some stage, um, much like Aaron Connolly desperately wants to play in goal. But um, but I, th- <laughs> I think that's the issue for for Kieran now is actually given the role he's being asked to put, play for the Giants. Where does he now fit into that roster? I think is the question, and I think that's the one I don't necessarily ask. I'm also going to say this as well, just because he stuck it in the in the chat. Uh, shout out to shout out to Scott Finley as well for for poking on it. Who's saying he needs to play on the fourth line at EIHL? Mate, you have not seen some of the nonsense. That's oh, come Scott my has. Uh, me and Scott have talked. Oh, didn't come across your feet. Uh, yeah. Right to answer your question then, and to answer your question, who does he replace and? This is in no particular order and in in no disservice to these boys, but the players that would be in that mix for me would be Ben Davis, would be Sean Norris, would be Cole Shudra, would be Brandon Whistle. Um, I think, obviously, with with the other guys you look at in the forward lineup, you, you've got Cade Nielsen, he's going to be there, Ben, ben Lake. Dowdy. Curran, you know, if you look at his Belfast form, you'd probably say no, but if you look at his commentary form, you'd definitely say yes. Uh, Cam Critchlow's had a very good year. Manchester had a good year. Lacko's had a good year. He's been brought in. I believe this might actually even be some of last year's squad that I'm looking at, but they it's a lot of the same faces. Um, I don't know. It, it's tough. We're in a tough division. I, I, I really think it's nitty-gritty if we're talking about 
these kind of guys, but ultimately we we want to get them going. Uh, I'm going to fast forward us because I do want to get to a couple of your comments, guys. I have seen them in the in, in the chat, but we do well, have another couple of th- stops before I inevitably because I'll, I'll probably have to go. That's before literally long, so where. Get... Yeah, yeah. And me also, because I'm fascinated because one of the things I think Ben, I think Ben, and this isn't to pump your tires too much, mate, but one of the things I think I'm I always find very interesting is how you approach dops as a thing on your show so i'm interested to kind of knock that ball around in here with you before uh, well ben all together take, take the lead my brother <laughs> well i don't really, show, I, maybe, I, I had to create a little segment at the beginning of the of the episode because i i changed the i changed the way i put my episodes out this year i've i sort of now do a roundup episode on a monday where i try and round up all the stuff from the weekend some and of then, that's been fast by the way mate like yeah I've, I've some of them have been around within like 18 hours time. yeah <laughs> fair play mate that's I mean, by the way for anybody that doesn't understand that is fucking so hard bravo mate like a lot of work goes into that folks a lot of work yeah well, especially as the way i've done it now i i record the podcast as a video and then i have to edit the video together so that it's got all and the, the coaches send me their thoughts via whatsapp audio and I have to put all of that in there, I and then I take so it as one video, rip the audio <laughs> off it, and then it goes out as a podcast, and it goes out on YouTube. Um, so yeah, it does take me a lot of time. I'm fortunate that my Monday afternoons aren't too swamped that I can get it done. But but yeah, we have to every week then talk about dops, and they've taken this sort of 10 p.m. Friday night. Twitter just explodes with Department of Player Safety. And the clubs are informed on the Thursday, so they they know what's going on. And it's been going wrong all year. Obviously, we, we know that the Darcy Flanagan one was where it all kicked off. What he did, some cracking episodes on it. Darcy came on Zero Pucks. And spoke by the way, that it. was so much fun. For, for Elite League fans, I was doing my best, way, like, tag it. Your chin was here. Yeah, <laughs> I was doing my best tag it for a couple of weeks, so that was fun. That's been a month. Of, like, I, was, I, was going, I was going fully fresh back to the roots. Well, just this, I spoke to Ty Cathcart this week, who's received six games. Six games, games mate. What a He's, he sent me the video, and it's 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 Some, here. Someone sent you the video, definitely yeah. wasn't Ty, <laughs> <laughs> definitely wasn't Ty, definitely didn't send it to me either. No, there's, there's no adverts <laughs> on it either, so I don't know where it came from, but it's, it's here. <laughs> And then it kind of slips up, but it's and it's like it's a, this Ben, right? When you, me and you come together on the camera right now, like this, and we bump, yeah. Like, by out. the way, on the ice, guys, Ben, do it at the exact same time. This is this is what it is. This, that is that's what happens when you collide at as my pen just did there. That's so what happens when you collide at impact. Like your hands come up, your feet come underneath you. It's never like I don't want to see a twenty. How are we supposed to be competing with these fucking nations when we were ban- banning our twenty-year-olds for six games, including the playoff finals, for what is essentially a hit? Now, I'm sitting on a bit of info, lads. Uh, um, obviously, I'm not going to put it out tonight, but ladies and gents, you're going to have to come back for this next week because we are going live with it next week. Department of Player Safety have obviously been hiding behind the the, the wall of. Anonymity this year, if that's even the right word. And right word, no, yeah. And yeah. anonymity, yeah. <laughs> well, don't <laughs> ask me how to say I was close enough, thanks. Ant knows enough. We've been sent a list of the names today of who's running it. So mm-hmm. um I'm gonna sit on it for a couple of days as well. I imagine Ant, you might have had the same message, Ben, you yeah. might have had the same message. Today's not the day for it. <laughs> but it's it's, it's Time to put up a fuck up because if you don't sort your shit out, like none of the you people that are on that list, I don't owe you shit. <laughs> I don't owe you shit. And I, I'm not much of a journalist as I'm, I'm not going to dig as deep as he is. But what I am going to do is I'm going to go back to go to bat for my boys and my boys are the players. And it, it will be announced. So however you want to play it in the next few days here, kind of give you a bit of a grace period if you want to kind of come out and announce them yourself that's cool if you don't i'm gonna do it anyway so like i i don't care you're ruining our sport and the people that are on that list not not one of you should be on it and what you're doing to our sport is nothing short of disgraceful really 
the fact that we should we shouldn't have to talk about this every week. We all have podcasts, and ultimately, every week we are. You said it, Ben. You've got to, you've got a new segment, mate. Like mm. it's it's not fun for us. Like, and I'm not saying this is about us by any stretch of the imagination. This is about the players more than anything. The players need to be able to know that they're going to go into a good body check and be able to give a good body check in a fifty fifty battle and come out for a twelve game suspension. And ultimately, when you have people that are in the positions that have not been in the positions, they shouldn't be making these calls. And they shouldn't be... We talked about it, like a guy like Lee Bonner. What's your investment in Lee Bonner? I'm, I'm not going to try and out his wages, so I'll give a I'll give a rough scale because I'm not going to try and out his wages. But let's say, for, for argument's sake, Bonner's wages are between 250 and £400 a week in Hull, right? He gets tossed for eight games, which is three to four weeks of the season, for a hit to the head, which is the chest. You have like a two and a half grand investment sitting on the sidelines for something he didn't do. That might be little Sammy's favourite player, who's a walk-up ticket buyer, who's now not going to come for three weeks because they only come to see Bones. And that costs a club. Like, there's so many things that the DPOS, a DOPS are responsible for this year. And this is also it, it, based it, on the fact as well. Sorry, mate. Go a, a hit to the head by Lee Bonner. Yeah, who's he Somebody hitting? Got... The fucking Oompa Loompa. <laughs> like, come on, Bones. I love you, bro, but you're a fucking battle smurf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you're a battle smurf, mate. Like, He'll have needed a ramp. He'll have needed a ramp to do it. I've got a great picture, one of my favourites, uh, at Lee Bonner's wedding. I went up last year to Bones' wedding. And it's a proper big brother cuddle. And I'm only 5'10", so I don't get to do that to a lot of people. But to Bones, it was like a arm round the shoulder. Fucking hell, I've got, I've got like four inches on you, five inches on you. He's, he's a little guy. He's not hitting someone who's six foot two to the head. It, it, the physics, the, the biology, the physics, nothing makes sense in that. I've got four to five inches on you. It's the sense as Nicky's not said since his last time in Ibiza. Um, the um, <laughs> the thing with Dops, right? seven or eight, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about inflation. Um, <laughs> the thing with Dops, right, is I think we can all agree that the premise is not a bad idea, right? Because this Great whole idea. idea of kind of a department of player safety. Obviously, the elite league got it, and it's kind of been the direction of travel that leagues across the world have kind of have kind of gone with. And obviously, there's some that don't that don't have it. You know, I don't know what the discipline's like in the South African Super League, for example. But even they have a discipline committee. But the idea of having a department of player safety in this notion, the idea to look at individual instances and then work out where you go from there, is not in and of itself a terrible plan. I think we can all kind of agree with that. And I like, like like Nikki says. I do things in Nikki and I do things in different ways because we're different people. Shockingly enough, so my thing will of course be that uh, having like Nikki has said that uh, he and I have both been sent a list of names. I will be going away and doing my checking because that's what I do. But it doesn't. But irrespective of the people who are on that list or not, the biggest issue here is not the principle but the execution. I think back to an incident last year in the Elite League where a player. I can't remember who it was, but it was a Guildford Flames player who got banned for a game for a check to the head when they'd elbowed somebody in the head. Now, the video was relatively clear that the player had skated past the player with his arm in and then stuck his elbow out and Pick elbowed the person in the head. And, you know, like the old, what I used to, in the EPL, I used to call the old Branislav Kvetan special. And um, uh, the, um, fuck that guy. and like the idea being is that in that, in that individual instance, they've suspended him but you've deliberately elbowed somebody in the head and you've given two games there and one game there. What's the difference here? That inconsistency within yeah. the elite league is one of those things that should over time, you'd assume get weeded out as you walk your way past it and you get more used to how these things happen. And obviously guys will stay around for longer and guys will come and go. Cause that's the nature of the elite league, right? It's, it's North American double a hockey transported into Britain. The idea of having tariffs for things was the EIHA's way, or England Ice Hockey's is now, is their way of eliminating that issue. If you commit this offence, this is the minimum you're getting, and we can then move up and down. That, again, some people will like that, some people will not. But the it's premise it. itself is not terrible. The biggest issue that you then have, and like Darcy Flanagan, talk about a 
talk about a dumpster fire of a year that poor guy had. Like, have you have you seen his missus? Kid. I'm sure he's not fucking complaining. No, that no. guy, that guy should, should just be counting his sweet. blessings. Yeah, yeah. But the he should just be counting that... his blessings. Get his kit and chuck it in a river, and just do still... whatever she says for the rest of time. But the point still stands, <laughs> right? If you can't get the basic physics and the basic biology correct. And then even if we then go down to the down to the, 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 this sort of basic level, the hit is here, not here. Now I'm not a tall man. I am five. I'm five, somewhere between five eight and five nine, right? That's so five a eight good, then, yeah. That's, <laughs> I'm closer to the five nine. Thank you very much. But even <laughs> then, right? That's a good. That's a good. That's a good few inches that would impress any anybody in any of the local student bars here in Southampton. <laughs> but this from the video we're not talking about indecipherable bits and pieces here this is about making mistakes and then not and then just not having a few really really basic things transparency and consistency because the only issue that we've seen is we've seen consistency of guys being given penalties for head hits where the head is not the primary point of contact. How yes, many concussions guys... have we seen this year, boys? Because for all the hit to the head penalties, yeah, I have not seen any concussion announcements other than Josh. Other than Josh Kelly, which, by the way, wasn't a hit to the head. It was just a coming together of bodies, which is generally when conkies happen. But... For all of these hits to the head, the reason that we're trying to eliminate the hits to the head is to eliminate concussions. I mean, no fucking concussions, because all the hits to the head have been in the middle of the 4,000 counting logo. Like, what are we doing here? Like, And, right, I'm going to ask you two points that Lee Mercer made, and I, I want to know your boy's opinion. First off, we we look at the tariff and we have a tariff that is split over three entities within the uh, within the EIHA development program, which is the national national one and the national two. Now we have fifty four games, we have twenty eight games, we have twenty two games. So if a hit to the head in the let's just say hit to head or cross check from behind, whatever the penalty is, high stick, call it what you want. But let's say it's 12 games at national, which is roughly 20% of the season. It then goes to be 12 games at NIHL 1 South, NIHL 1 North, which you then get into is like 40 odd percent of the season. And then you get to 12 games at NIHL 2, which is fucking 60% of the season. That I'm not saying that that if a guy in the NHL 2 smokes someone in the head, doesn't deserve to get suspended. Of course he does, but or she does, because there are some girls playing at that level, and then some of them girls like mix up some hits, fucking right girls, love to see it. But he's right. It, 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 it can't be 12 games, because if that... Right, if you're, if you're a pay-to-play club, and your sole survival is on having 20 guys paying fucking 100 pound a month from September until April to know that that's what you take to run your club. Then three guys get 12 game bans in December. What do you think guys at NHL two are going to come to pay to play when they have four months of no games, arguably until the next season, it might be September, October until they get to play again, depending on how the fixtures for when their ban lies. We're just going to be forcing people out of the game. They're just going to be like, do you know what? There's a mi- I've got a family. I've got two young kids. There's a million and one better things I could be doing than being suspended, going to Whitley Bay to watch a game. Like so, guys so, are going to so quit. Lee's point, so Lee's point is that the is that we need to remove is that the national needs to have a level, and then we need to have different tariffs for the lower leagues because they play less games. Is that is that the point? He's essentially, I, essentially, yeah. yeah, mate, yeah. Um, given the fact that we're all pretty much convinced that this probably isn't going to be an issue going forward, let me play let me play devil's advocate, particularly on hits to the head, right? Um, so I don't this I will say this is because this is there is a there is a logic to this argument, even though it's not one I particularly agree with. And then I will put and then I'll say the, the flip side of it. If you don't want to get suspended, make better on ice choices. Stop hitting people in the head. 
You are responsible for what you do. And therefore, irrespective of however many games is in a league season, if you do, stop doing stupid stuff, and you won't get suspended. That's now, not the problem, though. Ant. The problem is, that, Ant, though, is that, the hits. Like I say, the, the flip side of that, like, yeah, and there, and there is that. There is the issue with it. Is that it's all well and good saying that you shouldn't, but you shouldn't hit people in the head. But when you hit people in the chest, and people's biology is of such a level that, you, that people, uh, people think that we're all made of Picasso paintings, and we have body parts moved into everywhere, yeah, into different part, into different parts of us. How can we then, therefore, trust the system? The the biggest issue with DOPS is not an overhaul of the premise. It's not even an overhaul necessarily of the tariff system, although I have sympathy for Lee's argument there in that if you're playing a 28-game season, you shouldn't ban somebody for the same, unless, you know, unless he you know, takes his stick and you know, shoves it up his nose or something, like, then, then doing it that way. Oh, yeah, boys, look Can't... at it, right? 12, 12 games in a 22-game season, right? Yeah, he's, he's so what, what are we thinking is worth of one, no but of a six what no but like what sort of incident are we talking about let's ignore what league it is we're just going to go based on this number let's go from nhl to swiss to fucking to whatever, yeah, league yeah. to wherever what sort of shit are you having to do to be banned for 60 percent of the season 60 percent like so that's basically roughly what the numbers work out it is almost i say almost 60 it's probably near as damn it yeah so let's just say for that like i someone's gonna have to take a skate off and stab someone happy gilmore style like for 60 percent ban like i'm gonna see i'm gonna need to see like chief chris brand take a slap shot into the crowd hit a nun in the chest who was feeding and like a, a newborn baby. Like, I, I need, I need like something to really warrant a 60% of the season suspension, a mistimed hit, a bad shitty fucking Nokia 3310 video that's been sent in from the rafters with shit light. That is not enough to be suspending these guys for the entire year of the season. It's not enough to have young prospects who we want to be moving from NIHL 2 to NIHL 1 or NIHL 1 to the National League to be sitting and missing playoff games and to be missing the biggest stage of the season. And up and down the country, we're seeing that uh, right from Ty Kafka up to Tim Wallace. Like we are, we are seeing our talent sitting on the sidelines coming in to what is a business end of the season ultimately decisions made by people who are not qualified to make those decisions in my opinion 60 percent of the season sorry ben but 60 percent of the season should happen for me in two circumstances leaving the bench to uh, leave you'd have to have like left the bench had a a proper physical altercation that's then gone on and off the ice and you've made accidental contact with one of the officials or you've stolen all the chip spice from Hull. That's you know yeah. those are the two. I mean, that, those, the second one's probably fairer because I do like a bit of chip spice. But so the issue with the other, as you say, through the structure of the league, when uh, Lewis Clifford was on with me last week, and uh, if you've got an under eighteen player in your roster and he's still playing under eighteen hockey, banned for that as well. Yeah, so we we had a lad at Chelmsford this year. I, I think Lewis actually said it was it was Eden Rolf. He's up into the Chieftain squad. He's playing really, really well up there. But playing for the under-18s, he got a two-game ban. But because of the amount of games they play and the large gap between their games, he cannot play any other hockey until he's completed that two-game ban at the under-18s. So he misses three or four Chieftains games, possibly even more. But because he can't play <laughs> either side of this two-game ban for his, his under-18 side, that part is crazy. Right, then, I know I'm not. Said, no, I'm not massive on language, as Ant will, Ant will tell you. You are. But there's you're some massive on language. Just swearing is a language. Swear, isn't it? I mean, swearing is a language. But there's something you said there that that I pick up on, and and then we use the Department of Player Safety as language. Is it a fucking Department of Player Safety anymore? Because if your whole purpose is to make the player safe. Great. Everyone can get on board with that. Whilst also, let's think about the players that are suspended going into key situations of the season. Let's look back over their bands. Let's look at development. Let's look at the big picture. Let's look at getting a Ty Cathcart from Slough to the Bees, from Bees to Guildford, from Guildford to 
the the GB program or whatever. And he's just a player I'm using because he's suspended. I'm not saying he's good enough. I'm not saying he's ugly enough. I'm not saying he's big enough. But I'm using him as an example. What goes him being suspended for the business end of the season? He's going to lose a massive portion of his development of this season because do you know when you develop? When your balls are on the chopping block. Mm. And in playoff hockey, every time you step on the ice... Your balls are on the chopping block. It is knockout. You turn the fucking puck over and their import gets the puck and goes shelf. That's on you. Like all these situations, you're taking these young, talented players out of for bad decisions. And these decisions are being made by people who, uh, they've got no right making these decisions. And it's it's going to hinder us in the long run. We talk about progression. All three of our podcasts, huge on June development, huge on Brits, huge on growing the game huge on all of that are we cutting our ourselves off at the ankle are we cutting ourselves off at the knee are we cutting ourselves off at the hip what are we doing with these ludicrous suspensions because ultimately it's it's not about player safety because no one's getting fucking hurt nobody's get a couple of guys get a couple of chops over the year right okay we have we have nhl one north and south one and two there's there's four leagues, almost 40 teams. You have the national. There's another few teams on top of that. There's 50 odd teams. That's a lot of bodies. That's a lot of guys playing a lot of hockey year upon year upon uh, week upon week upon week. We are seeing injuries that you get from, from hockey. You get injuries, but we're not seeing anyone getting really badly injured from anything that's been hideous, anything that's been malicious, anything that's been really ferocious and dirty and downright fucking like dangerous. We're not seeing that. So if your whole responsibility is to to be the department of player safety, then protect the players, make sure the players are safe. But if you're just like a disciplinary school board type of fucking private school, this my way or the highway, you know, your dad can't land the helicopter on the top of the school anymore, then what are we doing here? Like, then if it's about keeping the players safe, then keep the players safe. If it's not, and it's about a pissing contest to see how many long bands we can hand out, the sport's screwed. And then handing out the long bands, they're making 500 quid every time it gets appealed. Mark made a comment, and by the way, before he made the comment on 4,000 Counting, he made the comment to me weeks before, and then we interviewed Rory Herman, and he brought it up. And God bless Rory. I'm sorry, son. We put you on the spot a little bit, my lad, but we didn't mean to. Um, We just like said, you know, like hypothetically speaking, after all the shenanigans that have gone on this year, will we see imports get banned come playoff time for something that's nothing? Listen, so that they have to. Gail Labuelle at the moment. Gail Labuelle, uh, uh, Tim and Wallace. Let's sit on Callum, on Callum Bouglas as to whether that's going to be anything. So, of course, it's Thursday night, gentlemen. So, if anything's come out of that hit, we're going to find out before too long whether anything is uh, anything's going to come of that. And Swindon fans, obviously, are hoping he's not suspended. And Peter fans think he should be, you know, like flung in the Tower of London for it. But mm. the fact that we're having this, the fact that we need to have that kind of conversation, not of whether. Not of whether, oh, you know, maybe it'd be, you know, three games or four games. We just genuinely don't know, like, whether he's going to be banned for 20 games or given a packet of Monster Munch and a, and a well-done handshake. That's the problem, is that the 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 sphere of where it all ends up has become so wide that the notion of, not even so much the notion of player safety, but just the notion of basic functioning of a disciplinary system has gone out of the window because there's so little consistency. You just don't know. And I think that's the, that, and that is, that ultimately is what makes players unsafe because the one thing I don't really want is a 200 pound man skating around on knife blades, a little bit unsure about how hard or how fast he's going to want to hit the other person. Because you know what, in that, if you're traveling at 30 miles an hour on blades, the one thing you don't want to be is unsure of what you're doing with a weapon in your hand. Which is hilarious because that's pretty much, you said the best game you've been to this season was Stretton versus Slough in the in the cup final. Yep. And my dad said the worst game he's been to this year is Stretton versus Slough because it was not long, earlier on in the year, not long after DOPS had started fucking handing everything out. And he was like, guys are <clears> going <throat> into the corner and they were like... Um, yeah, you just yeah, just fucking break the puck out, mate. Yeah, it's fine. I'm not gonna hit you. He was like, it, you you were seeing guys like you, 
the rule is whenever you play for one of my teams, you play one of my dad's teams, you skate 180 feet on the four check, you you you, you finish that hit. Yeah. Whereas guys are now going, should I hit him? Should I turn away? Mm. Should I should I be apprehensive? And guess what? That's when you accidentally get stuck in the teeth and lose all your jibs because normally I see this guy skating down at me. I'm like, he's gonna hit me. Okay. Get get protect myself, get next to the boards, put a puck over here. Protect the puck, protect myself. Now I'm like, is he going to hit me? Is he not? Oh, he doesn't know. He he swings away all of a sudden, starts to to button hook up ice, and he hits you with a trade instead. These are the ones where guys are actually going to get injured. Whereas if you keep the physical play, every European hockey league I've seen this year, to to its credit, has been massively physical. Every hit has been finished. But none of them are suspensions. None of them are penalties. Um, boys, we've been going a long time. It's gone after eleven. Um, yeah, and I, Ant's going to fall. Ant's going to fall asleep. Uh, this has been fun, Ben. I wish you the best of luck with your your commentary gig this weekend. Thank you we, very, we much. Like, I'm very we, much. Very much. Look forward to it. We'd like to see the the boys getting repped. And I believe you are at the bees this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, Peter, uh, bees versus Peterborough for for me uh, for me this weekend. Uh, would have loved to have gone to Ali Pali, but yeah, I've got I've got the got the mother in law's birthday on on Sunday, so I need to need to defer to such bits and pieces. But I will be I will be uh bees this weekend, Swindon Raiders the following weekend, and I'm waiting for the last weekend to kind of see where I end up. And then I will be at Coventry. My uh what I'm doing is to be confirmed officially. Um but the uh uh I will I will be I'll be floating around at Coventry. Don't you worry, folks. Well, for four funds and counting, we potentially work work related. If if we can make it work, we'll be at Ali Pay for Saturday this week. But most definitely, we'll be in Edinburgh for the SNL next weekend, and the following weekend we will be at the Elite League Playoff Finals weekend. We have three live playoff podcasts coming your way: two from Saltbox, one from the Green Room. Ladies and gents, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching on YouTube. And if you're watching back, make sure you share this with your friends. Like, subscribe, do all the usual good stuff. Go check out Banners on the Wall. Go check out Zero Pucks Given. And we will see you, ladies and gents, again very, very soon for another episode. Peace.